there actually updates in physics, maybe mid-century, that were not disclosed to the public? Well, I mean, we quieted down because no one ever got anywhere, or quieted it down because it did get somewhere and it went black. Ladies and gentlemen, it's finally here, the much-anticipated conversation with Eric Weinstein and Hal Putoff. The world's most brilliant physics mind, Vartan, is the son of the country's most prominent and important anti-gravity researcher of the 1950s. I don't know what any of this is. Hal is an electrical engineer and laser physicist. Former NSA and CIA, Hal was a senior advisor to ATIP, the official government UFO investigation program that ran from 2007 to 2012 out of Bigelow Aerospace. He also founded and ran the CIA's psychic spy program called Stargate out of Stanford Research Institute in the 70s. Does our government have a protocol to wield stigma as a tool for keeping its programs secret? Certainly there are parts of the government who consider that to be their job. Many of you are already familiar with my colleague Eric Weinstein. He's a mathematician who's dared to construct a unified theory of physics called geometric unity. He's also a prominent yet rebellious cultural commentator who founded the intellectual dark web. I still carry the sense of I cannot believe I'm sitting here discussing visitations from some intelligent life that we don't understand. <laughs> this interview is neither for the queasy nor the faint of mind. There are more videos, some are better. How much better? As good as you could probably want. For many of your comments, I haven't cut much from this interview. I left it pretty raw, long form, and unedited. It's a deep technical dive into the physics of UFOs, along with the implications of their prominence in the modern zeitgeist. That is that we are either being subjected to the most interesting, effective, and weird government psyop of all time, or our top scientists are missing something fundamental about the nature of reality. And finally, Hal gets about as candid as he's ever been about the government psychic spy program Stargate, while Eric, who's a little more skeptical of parapsychology, tries not to throw up. We ran 70-30 instead of 50-50. Sorry. But if you want to do it, feel free to do it. I've, I've told you how to do it, so you can just go do it. Okay. You don't have a lot of room to move. You either have to postulate new physics, or you have to say this isn't material. Everything here is bold. My conclusion is that there is something there. I don't like losing to Jesse. It's horrible losing him on UFOs. I don't want to lose to him the second time. <laughs> but something's wildly off. So with that out of the way, hit subscribe and get ready to unlearn everything you thought you knew about the material world with Eric Weinstein and Hal Putoff. Fukushima today. 11 years have passed since the Great East Japan earthquake. Roads and railways have reopened, and cities have sprung back to life, fueling the passion of the people and inspiring action. Today, Fukushima forges ahead on a steadfast journey of recovery. Always moving forwards. Learn about Fukushima's steadfast journey of recovery in the full video. Hello everyone, welcome to App Exchange Mavericks. I am Deepa Patel. And I'm a Salesforce MVP. I've been one since 2012, and I've been Fuck also off, speaking lady. at Dreamforce since 2012. I don't care. Today we different parts of the brain have different activities. You know that, don't you? Maybe you should interview me. Intelligence Committee has ordered the Director of National Intelligence and the Secretary of Defense to deliver a report on the mysterious sightings of unidentified aerial phenomena, UAP, more commonly known as UFOs. The reason I found the report fascinating was because it reeked of conflict. I could clearly detect a voice, an authorial voice, that wanted to disclose more and one that said over my dead body. And the over my dead body people seem to be stronger but losing ground. The, the first branch of the decision tree is, is it stuff that is unintentionally in the air versus stuff that is intentionally in the air? The unintentional stuff was broken into two categories. And that was clutter and atmospheric effects. The stuff that is intentionally in the air was broken into the next branch, which was us, not us. 
not us was broken into two things, known others and unknown others. And that other is intentionally in the air, not us, not anyone we know. Not necessarily aliens, could be coming out of the ocean, could be time travel, I mean, who the hell knows? But anything in that other category is astonishing. I think one very important thing that most people in government who study this seem to sort of have a consensus on that the public might not realize is the idea that there is a separation between substrate and signature uh, when it comes to UFOs. And there might be a difference in terms of the way somebody perceives it and some underlying sort of proto-architecture. And so if we have been seeing these things for thousands of years, we've been seeing them in different forms. Different forms and maybe <coughs> different sources. Mm -hmm. These days, since our technology platforms are so high to generate effects, they could mimic, and uh, our detection platforms are so well advanced so that we could see a lot more, then it really is a zoo of options and possibilities. And so, for example, for the Tic Tac videos that are so well known, Lou Elizondo was behind uh, releasing those videos. I remember seeing them in the Pentagon before they were released. <coughs> but there are more videos, some are better, how much better? Um, well, as good as you could probably want. If, I, if you showed me pieces of a craft and you guaranteed me somehow that it came from outside the solar system, my first thought wouldn't be technology. It would be physics. Because everything is so far away from us, other than our solar system, that I would be wondering, well, how did it get here? When you look at the Civil War, in the United States. It took place in the 1860s. Within less than a hundred years, we were dropping fusion devices from jet aircraft. Less than a hundred years, less than a single lifetime, it means that we almost had a nuclear civil war. And it was a very near miss. Now what separated the 1860s, which looked like antiquity to mm. many of us, from 1952 when we have the first fusion weapon explode. It was changes in our understanding of the physical world. That means any time you have a profound physical insight post, I don't know, 1940s, you have to ask yourself, what Pandora's box would a new physical insight potentially open? Mm. And I don't know why we're not more worried about this. I think because we've been failing at physics for 50 years, we've gotten out of the habit of thinking physics is really dangerous and you have to track every single important physicist. Because any change in our physical understanding of the universe can unlock holy hell. Were there actually updates in physics, maybe mid-century, that were not disclosed? I'm on the clock. What you want? Some wheels? Another puzzle we'd love to have cleared up is an understanding of the role of aerospace companies as holders of potentially basic scientific knowledge not shared with the academic world. Is it possible? It seems very wrong to me. It may be wrong, but it's um, true. It is true. You believe it's true. Yeah, I know it's true. You know that there's physics knowledge held by aerospace companies that is not There known. certainly is materials knowledge. Materials, well, okay, material Which science. involves topological physics and whatever. Okay. But fundamental physics as opposed to, you know, condensed matter or... Right. Certainly aerospace corporations have knowledge in the UAP area that specifically are... Okay, I got stuff to do. ...against FOIA. Oh, because of proprietary I appreciate labels, that. the whole thing was set up to be that on purpose. Right, but the idea that it would be fundamental physics knowledge that would be housed in an aerospace company and not shared with the physics community, there is no evidence for that. No evidence for it, not, not that I know of. And I would that, that doesn't mean it's not a physics but That would be this crazy egregious... It would change our entire concept of who we are if somebody kept 
fundamental physics secret in the years since we became capable of exploding fusion devices. I would grab a pitchfork <laughs> and a tiki torch and I would march on the National Science Foundation. Right, right. I, I don't, I, I still can't believe that that's true. It would only be if it were the case that in fact we have mastered anti-gravity and are being built by aerospace corporations, then new physics would have to be involved. <laughs> is what is called the golden age of general relativity tied to these topics? That is, there was this bizarre surge of activity in general relativity between, you know, I would say the time of Einstein in the 50s or something like that. There wasn't a ton of development. In GR, and then suddenly there was this explosion. There was a well. This explosion. Uh, there, there's a famous uh, series came out in Miami Herald and other newspapers in um, probably the 50s. The author was Talbert, and he did a series where he found out that a number of aerospace engineering companies were suddenly interested in anti-gravity, and that people like Dewitt on up and down really top level physicists were suddenly getting grants to look at the idea of anti-gravity. For example, the uh, gravity essay came along. The Gravity Research gravity Foundation in Boston. Foundation, right. And so it looked like it was going to be a big explosion. But anyway, then it all sort of quieted down. And I could take two implications of that, and that is it quieted down because nobody ever got anywhere or it quieted it down because it did get somewhere and it went black. Foundation in New Boston, New Hampshire, and I guess that was the work of Babson. And the story is uh, sort of not really very plausible that his sister drowned in a pond or something to that effect. And so he, uh, gravity is his sworn enemy. Um, you know the story? No, I had not heard it. Oh, yeah. So Babson contacted Lewis Witten, who was coming out of Johns Hopkins. And then, oddly, a similarly named individual named Bainson, with some sort of tobacco or air conditioning fortune, reaches out to Bryce DeWitt and asks whether he will found an institute at the University of North Carolina at yes, Chapel right, Hill right. for the study of physical fields. And particularly focusing on gravity. Particularly focused on gravity. Now, somehow DeWitt has the courage to answer this essay contest in the other silo and destigmatizes it. So there was money to be had, but nobody wanted to touch it because of fear of ridicule from their colleagues. And, and then there's a famous gravity conference at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill that sort of kicks a lot of this off. It's a tremendous flurry of activity at a time when anti-gravity was trying to break into respectability. At a minimum, we know that the Glenn Martin Company where Martin was an early pioneer, I think from the time of the Wright brothers, um, that the Glenn Martin Company becomes Martin Marietta, later becomes Lockheed Martin. So that word Martin is coming all the way through. Was employing, uh, I believe, Lewis Witten, uh, Edward Witten's father, to do anti-gravity research, somehow tied up with Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio uh, and the Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland. 
So there's something about aerospace in the 1950s and sort of post-Manhattan Project era that's pretty potent. And we're confused by this. Why was Solomon Lefschetz, the great topologist, recruited to be involved with uh, Lewis Witten and to have an entire nonlinear group uh, working on mathematics that then gets moved to Brown University when I believe that the, that these programs are sunset so they get spun off back into the academic ecosystem. I don't know what any of this is. So you have top physicists working on because crazy stuff, anti-gravity. Most physicists don't know the school. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's like, I knew it because it was weird. It stood out. The Lewis Witten, Edward Witten story has never been fully made sense. The world's most brilliant physics mind of our time mm -hmm. is the son of the country's most prominent and important anti-gravity researcher of the 1950s. Do you think that string theory, which Ed Witten worked on, is intentionally a bridge to nowhere? I have privately said to you that string theory was a very odd development because it both allowed physics to proceed as if it was doing something new while breaking no new ground in the physical world in which we live. I don't really know. If you were trying to stagnate the field, string theory is pretty brilliant. If there was knowledge that allowed you to, to traverse the cosmos, in other words, if you could render Einstein's theory effective, uh, just the way Einstein rendered Newton's theory non-fundamental, but an effective theory derived from Einstein's theory in a limit, to not share that knowledge with the physics community would be seen as gross academic and intellectual malpractice. You know, if somebody had that level of knowledge, I mean, <coughs> the best that uh, you know, we could do in the, in the ATIP program was say, okay, let's accept Einstein's GR as being the theory, okay. even though there are all kinds of arguments for it. By GR, you mean general relativity. General relativity. And uh, for this subject area, for the UAP subject area, as far as, as we've gone, is to say, okay, suppose I treat general relativity, Einstein's equations for general relativity, the way I would treat Maxwell's equations for electromagnetism. If we could manipulate variables in Einstein's equations, the way we ma manipulate uh, variables in Maxwell's equations, you would see certain kinds of things which tend to match claimed observations of UAP phenomena. Somewhere there's a missing key for how you can do manipulation of those variables in Einstein's equations without having to have a black hole in your pocket. Are you talking about the idea that you want to promote constants to field content, to be actual physical fields that can vibrate and live and move. Yes. But then you have the quantum mechanical consequences. When you promote something to field content, you break it, you bought it. You've got a lot of uh, you know, fluctuations and, and uncertainty principles. It contributes to all sorts of uh, processes, and sometimes you get uh, you know, explosions of terms of series, and things stop converging. It's been quite bad. Is that something that you feel you've handled? Fukushima, the allure of boundless food tourism. In Fukushima, the freshness of fish never ceases to amaze. In Fu well, at a certain level. How can we describe in layman's terms the idea of promoting a constant, like the gravitational constant, into a, a field variable. So a very kind of helpful, actually, analogy you used for me, who's a, I'm a total idiot when it comes to this stuff, is a circle and pi being a constant. You know, pi, the area of the circle is pi or squared. Uh, and so if the circle had bumps in it, or if it was topologically different in some way, pi wouldn't be pi. Pi would sort of uh, be more variable. In such circumstances, something that you thought was a constant turns out to be variable when considered in a larger space of possible. Likewise, if I ask, what is the temperature in this room, I feel a little bit chilly, you might say, I think the temperature is 64. Uh, 
so we might find out that in fact the room varies between 63 degrees and uh, 69 degrees in a different part of the room. So something that you thought was a number, like we just we had inflation estimates of 6.8 and then 7.0%, and I was very angry about that because my claim was that you should report inflation on various maps the way you show the temperatures in the country uh, on a temperature map of gradients and isotherms and what have you. If you do that to numbers like, for example, the gravitational constant, that constant could be the value of a function. And if it was the value of a function, and then that function became quantum mechanical, you would have to treat it quantum mechanically. It's not cheap to replace a number by a function or a field. You have an entire planet pulling us uh, towards these couches. And yet, when the interview yeah. is done, we will get up from these couches, defeating right. an entire planet. The weakness of gravity is right. one of the great mysteries uh, of our lives. It's inconceivably weak. True. And if we accept gravity, Einstein's general relativity, is, is, uh, again, I'm not quite sure how much of it you, you take issue with, it would seem that we are either prisoners here or that we have to lean so heavily on time dilation or we would have to mass levels of energy. I mean, your point is... Yeah, we, we, all, can't, we can't do it from what we know. For sure. Okay. So then the idea is we'd have to have something wrong in GR. Yeah, something is at least missing. Okay. And maybe GR is okay as it goes, but we're missing something that would have the effect of manipulating the variables in there that we can't do with any reasonable engineering approach. Well, so far as I know, there's only one analog that even smells vaguely like this in electromagnetism. Aronoff and Bohm argued that if you passed an electron beam around a solenoid yep. and passed a current through it, if it was perfectly insulated, you would have no E and B fields out, that is electric, electric right. and magnetic fields, outside of the solenoid. But yet you'd get a phase shift in the yeah. electron beam as it circled. This is what's known as a holonomy effect. You guys talk about this incredible experiment called the bohm aronoff effect. Can you show me the actual experiment? Imagine you have some sort of an electron gun, and you have a beam of electrons, and they hit a first mirror, so that they bounce off of that mirror. You have a next mirror in the form of a diamond, and I'm looking down on my tabletop experiment, and I've got some sort of a detector over here. If I have a wire here, it's heavily, heavily insulated. I can imagine running a current through this wire, the solenoid in the center, and the E and B fields would be dead equal to zero because of the insulator. However, when I pass current through this wire, mysteriously the detector picks up different patterns of self-interference of the phase of the electron function. In other words, this setup can detect whether there's current passing through the wire despite near-perfect insulation. That was what was so frightening in the late 50s, is that we were discovering that it wasn't the electromagnetic fields at all that were really the important actor in the electromagnetic story. We thought we understood electromagnetism from mm. the time of Maxwell, mm. but clearly the electromagnetic floor potential was really the main actor. Do we understand the nature of the electromagnetic floor potential? Or is it just this sort we of do. weird Geometrically, I think we have a very good. Okay. And so you mentioned the Higgs field looking like something like, a, you know, analogous to like a wine bottle what would the electromagnetic floor potential geometrically look like? Quality and craftsmanship forge dependability. Shop great offers on a brand new Ram and discover what it truly means to drive a truck that's built. Well, it looks like a version of the Escher staircase or the Penrose stairs. Um, in effect, those stairs would be something like, we would call them horizontal subspaces, the weird feature of going around a circuit and always going up the stairs and yet never climbing in height. 
uh, that would be what we would call a holonomy effect due to curvature. Paradox. And you can go way beyond that, so there are all kinds of uh, toroidal geometries, for example, where you have no EM field whatsoever, but you have strong vector scalar fields. And since you have no Lorentz force in the absence of E and B, then how can you detect them? Well, you detect them by um, any kind of quantum detector that can detect phase shifts, can detect the vector scalar potential even in the absence of fields. So there's a whole engineering approach uh, concerning which I have two patents, by the way, and I started a new company. Um, it involves only dealing with uh, vector scalar potentials. When you uh, are trying to come up with this analogy between electromagnetism and general relativity to explain some of these effects, are you dealing only with the levy chimita connection of the metric as Einstein did, or are you considering... I'm basically the dealing with the metric coefficients by postulating a dielectric vacuum whose dielectric constant values for, say, epsilon and mu, the permeability and the permittivity of the vacuum, can be manipulated. And once you manipulate those, you're manipulating C, which is one of the screwed of mu epsilon. And so once you begin to manipulate C, then you can change effects associated with all of the... And so you can, with this, with this uh, polarizable vacuum approach, which I published in uh, Physics Journal, um, you can get all of the, quote, tests of general relativity and so on. So, so the fact that you might be able to pursue that further by taking into account the fact that underlying electromagnetism is, is uh, vacuum fluctuations, which have the effect of controlling the value for epsilon and mu. So then you say, okay, well, if I want to go with general relativity, maybe I can control the underlying uh, values for the metric coefficients. So there are various mathematical approaches to kind of pushing Einstein's equations to be not quite Einsteinian. So we're not talking about, this is what has been confusing to me, there's a question of accepting the Einsteinian prism or trying to do to Einstein what Einstein did to Newton and then say there's a more fundamental theory. And what you're really saying is, is that you're trying to come up with a more fundamental theory than general relativity in which many of the things that are hard-coded are in fact vacuum expectation values that are only discernible within the yeah, theory. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. There are consequences after impact. You have a theory that is a greater, it's more expansive than Einstein. Einstein would be... You can locate Einstein within it. You can locate Einstein within it. And so, does any of this stuff in geometric unity, your theory, dovetail with what you're seeing in terms of observables with UFOs and UAPs. There are two strong versions of geometric unity. In one case, you put an extra six dimensions as time di dimensions into, into the mix. And so one plus six is seven. And then you've got four extra spatial dimensions, four plus the three spatial dimensions we already know is seven. So you'd have what we would call a split signature metric seven and seven, seven times seven space. And the other way of, of effectively gluing these extra dimensions is, in is to flip them. So you'd have four extra time dimensions. That would be five time dimensions in total versus nine spatial, three that we know, plus six new ones. In either case, though, you're talking about multiple temporal dimensions. And even physicists rarely talk about multiple temporal dimensions because it completely breaks our paradigm of what we might call Hamiltonian dynamics. Mm. The idea that you, you can take any situation in space and then propagate it through time to get the future. Mm. When you have more than one time dimension, you have more than one future. You have no arrow of time. You have a whirlpool of time for the first additional time dimension, 
and you have a right hand rule of, uh, of time and so this arrow of time becomes something you would call a time orientation and then the weird horrible thing about that if I may use the board yeah go for it when you have more than one temporal dimension you now have a new possibility that you've never considered which is you could go back into this extra time, extra time dimension and find yourself at an earlier event without ever having to retrace time steps. You wouldn't have to run time backwards. We don't really know how to think about these things very well. They lead to something which is called ultra-hyperbolic equations. And we don't have a ton of focus or skill around these sorts of problems. One of my biggest concerns is, is that if geometric unity turns out to be true, we don't know what it means to be able to hack extra temporal dimensions. Hmm. And that's a big concern. I mean, it would probably explain some of this, uh, at least observably faster than speed of light travel. You see, that's the thing. There is no faster than light travel. And we have to train people away from saying, you think have, we have faster than light travel. Mm -hmm. There may be something that would appear to be fast. Which temporal dim dimension hack? Which sort of makes it, because a lot of these UAPs seem to sort of materi de materialize and dematerialize at will. Look, there's certainly scope for pattern matching if you have things like dark chemistry, dark light, um, if you have uh, multiple spatial and temporal dimensions beyond what we know. The concern, though, is we don't know whether they're accessible. The interest and the fear we are so proud that we would be one day recognized as the best pizza in New York. So if you order on Gold Belly, it is going to be the best pizza of your life. I can't stop eating it. Find those in the kitchen. Manufactured stigma and control had people actually shut down this program on the basis that American taxpayer dollars could not be spent on pursuing demonic technology. You know Dan Sheehan? Yeah. 
I was friendly with Dan Sheehan and admired his work on all of these crazy cases against the government, not knowing he had any interest in UFO UAP. There was an attempt to discredit him through stigma because of his interest in the Iran Contra uh, matter right. with the Christic Institute. And so I think he was fed wrong information, probably, so that he swing at a bad pitch. Um, and that's why I was very interested in the weaponization of stigma and whether or not you were party to any knowledge of how that is carried out so as to keep the programs. No, I've never, uh, uh, other than um, being the effect of it. You do want to keep things like the Loch Ness Monster and spoon bendings away from the UFO conversation if you can. And there's this tremendous force in this world to say, well, if we're opening our minds to UFOs, uh, my aunt lived in this house that was haunted for 27 years. Like, I don't want to hear this. I don't want to listen to the fact that your aunt's house is yeah. haunted. Now, the thing that goes against what I'm saying is something like cattle marriage. So either somebody is an amazing, sadistic animal hoaxer, or you have to open the UAP story to them communicating something by their decision to study cattle or leave cattle as presents for us or who knows what. So that brings up this really That's weird place boring, called Skinwalker Ranch in, in Utah. I think it's a, near the U Utah Basin. In Uinta. Uinta Basin. And so it, there's a myth that involves the Ute tribe fighting the Navajos. And I believe the Navajos sick these skinwalkers, these sort the of were collaborating with the United States government. The Navajo <laughs> weren't so happy, and so they cursed this particular spot of land with skinwalkers. And uh, the family that used to live on the land would see tons of cattle mutilations. They, they'd experience all sorts of paranormal yes, didn't see me. things. Bigelow buys it. Bigelow's obviously very interested in the you know uh, UAP phenomena. And now it seems like it's this place where they do all sorts of experiments they have anomalous electromagnetic effects on the grounds so what do you what do you make of this something is wild i'm on the clock what you want some wheels this stuff is interesting enough that it should be attracting scientists and the scientists who are attracted to this should be debunking the living crap out of this if it's some dime store bs but the absence of scientists is itself puzzling yeah. Partially due to stigma, partially due to the fact that nobody wants to get sucked into some low rent uh, horror movie where two kids on the way. see a creature. I'll get back to it then. And they try to tell the townspeople and no one believes them. Yeah. The question is, is the stigma manufactured or is the stigma stigma because all this stuff is bullshit? We're pretty clear that a lot of stigma is manufactured. Mm -hmm. So the government talks about in internal documents image cheapening. And what's the context in which image cheapening is, has been used or Famously against a woman who was a leading actress in Hollywood named Jean Seberg. And the FBI, this is how we learned about image cheapening, um, planted a story with a woman named Joyce Haber in the Los Angeles Times that the baby that she was carrying was in fact not her French husband's, but was in fact the, the baby of a black panther. They drove her to suicide. They drove her to miscarriage first and then 10 years of suicide attempts. But the key point is our government does not necessarily blink mm -hmm. trying to turn your reputation into absolute garbage if you get close to its treasured sources and methods. Yeah. And that is not compatible with saying that we have something that we don't understand menacing our military, its airspace, and our nuclear system. You're through to your garage. You, uh, need me to bring you a ride? here, and then it's hard to sort of separate. There has to be psyop. There has to be. Because Project Blue Book yes. and the Pentagon report do not seem to be particularly compatible. In other words, it appears that either we were lying then, uh -huh. that there's nothing to see, yeah. and we're telling the truth now, or we're telling the truth then that there's nothing to see, and we're lying now that UFOs are here. What I find really interesting about the Blue Book history is Edward J. Ruppelt was sort of running Blue Book. He was an Air Force general, and he seemed pretty open-minded to the phenomena being real, especially after kind of an empirical inquiry. And 
then in 1952, something very bizarre happened, which is there were a bunch of spotting. I'll get there as soon as I can. Around Washington, D.C. in July 1952. And then there's a, there's a Caltech physicist named H.P. Robertson who forms kind of a panel. And the conclusion of the panel is basically um, the government needs to systematically downplay the importance of the phenomena. And uh, if the public were to know the truth, it would touch off mass hysteria. Every single uh, head of Blue Book from that point forward, from 52 to 69 when it ended, uh, became progressively more kind of anti-UFO. And so the question is, is this, you know, typical CIA leaked doc to lead us off the trail and is it bullshit? Or um, did, was manufactured stigma created between 1952 and 1969? And actually, Blue Book maybe initially was kind of open to... What happened in 1952? The DC UFO sightings in, in July. Yeah, well, I was going to say the... Well, what else? The first H-bomb. The H-bomb. Te teller, yeah. The teller alone design. Yeah. So the concern that I have is that in 1952, we sent off a signal. Just, way, just the way when North Korea detonates a nuclear device, it sends seismic waves through the Earth. You can't stop sending information outside of the country. I think in 1952, we sent a signal to the cosmos which is that we're very, very close to being in possession of root-level knowledge to take us off our map. We are about to become root, which is terrifying if you're a system administrator that you've got a hacker that's about to get full control of the system. It's like your edge.org question, which was, uh, what happens when we discover our own source code? Does something unprecedented happen? Does something when, unprecedented happen? When man finds Aliens. Well, people didn't understand what the question was. So it was the final edge question. And, Instead of giving an answer, he asked us to give a question. Mm -hmm. um, the concern that I have is that in 1952, what if there was someone there to hear what we said in the Pacific? Mm. If there was something or someone there to hear oh, us, they probably heard us as saying, we're on the verge of being able to come visit. That's terrifying. If you want to live a life of meaning, you have to choose to some extent a life of suffering. Shut up. The, the Stargate program, which you ran, which is a government sort of psychic spy program, uh, ran from 1972 to 1995, and it ended in 1995 under Ed May. And, you know, a lot of people after that said that it wasn't all that effective. See, that's part of the, uh, the, the stigmatization. Well, I was just reading Skinwalker at the Pentagon, you know, where it talks about ATIP and, and I guess OSAP, you know, OSAP, these two programs. Uh, and it looks like remote viewing is sort of, again, revived. I, I guess don't, I don't think it ever really died. So, so, so the question is, yeah, or is that is that um, creating a stigma because you're bundling in parapsychology, um, which might be pseudoscience with UFO stuff, or, or is it, is there some connection between those two things? Because there seems like a lot of overlap in terms of the people interested in parapsychology stuff and the people interested in the UFO stuff. As Jacques Collet and Eric Davis put out a very nice paper of six levels of UAP phenomena, which range all the way from nuts and bolts at the bottom to spiritual or metaphysical hey, aspects at the doing? top and everything kind of in between, uh, can you can you break that down for us? So what, what are the six levels, and how how uh, is, are the nuts and bolts at all tethered to spiritual phenomena? Well, see, they're the nuts and bolts things, but then some of the consequences of the nuts and bolts things are changes in what we call ordinary reality, which people who are the effect of might claim that that's some kind of paranormal thing because that's the only word they can come up with to describe it. So. There are paranormal things, and then it's sort of a gradation from there uh, in the things that are purely non-physical, but supposedly, quote, possibly psychokinesis. I have to admit, I have such a strong visceral negative reaction. It's very interesting because, as Jesse will tell you, Jesse was interested in this UFO, UAP stuff, and I couldn't be in the room with it. I just I hated the topic. It always felt like garbage to me. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And I found out that I was apparently wrong about that. The federal government is certainly tracking this. It doesn't make any sense to me still that we have all these sensors and we don't have great video all over the place. I don't know how these UAPs you know, could possibly evade all of the cameras that we have outside of the government. Uh, and that we, we have no conclusive proof. But assume, OK, I was wrong about that at some level because we are now discussing this in the open. So I'm willing to start to revise everything that is protected by my desire to throw up. Right? There's, there's just that just shows the, the stigma programs. No, no, absolutely. <laughs> well, it was on me, right? I'm, I'm being honest and open. Yeah. I still carry the sense of I cannot believe I'm sitting here discussing visitations from some intelligent life that we don't understand potentially. Uh, but okay, so you know, a scientist should be able to consider these things, and I'm not going to be the prisoner of the stigma. But I am yeah, going to ask. You got A.V. Loeb at Harvard setting up this yeah. thing to pursue it. But, the, but, the, but that, that, this is a really important question. If, if you could set up a ton of sensors, how would we know what we're seeing at high sample size if right now we don't know what we're seeing at low sample size? And I think one question I'd have for you, where I'd challenge you, is yeah. <laughs> is is there some physics that we will figure out in the future this is what around saying. certain ability, uh, around certain people's ability to see these things? And that's that sounds for. really pseudoscience and crazy, but most of the people involved in the program seem to think that there's something ar around that. And as far as, far as uh, you know, why aren't we getting really clear pictures? I mean, I'm not, I wouldn't say that that's necessarily the case that we're not getting there. You may be getting but really clear pictures. The average guy with an iPhone, let, let's say the craft is there, but it's manipulating the space-time metric. So you're just going to get fuzzy outlines because light is being bent in various ways around the craft and so on. So if you're going to get a lousy picture, it doesn't mean because it isn't.
you looking for? there I would imagine I would be drowning in high quality video and it's, it's, it's a great puzzle to me that I'm sitting here discussing this I can't even solve this puzzle and then the related puzzle having to do with remote viewing or anything like that is if I take a materialist perspective that the world is created of material whose laws can be understood and you put me in and, and you or say in two lead lined rooms and we try to make sure that there's no way that any of the known forces or matter happy. fields can communicate. You know, I, my mind goes to, you know, are we claiming that neutrinos are carrying the information? Are we claiming that there's a new force? Are we claiming that um, the world isn't material? It, you know, the it, entanglement uh, is more... See, this is spread out than... Well, well, entanglement would be one of those things like Bohm, Aronoff, yeah. and Casimir, which has the appearance. What the fuck is wrong with this piece of shit? What am I doing for you?
something spooky, right? In other words, if, if you had a, a culture in which magicians possessed scientific knowledge, they would have an edge over everyone else because they could explain, they could predict the bone Aronoff effect. See, I can, I can manipulate this electron beam without what even... What you need, boss? Some wheels? I can bring them around. Right, so it, this gets to the issue of advanced science being indistinguishable from magic. And then the idea that this is, in some sense, held by particular silos over other silos. I mean, as a scientist, I either want to laugh or my blood boils. Well, I mean, that's <clears throat> kind of justifiable. I'll this bring it by. Uh, for example, early on in the CIA remote viewing program that uh, I set up at SNI, I was asked to check out claims of the psychic Ingo Swan. Ingo had done experiments at City College in New York under Professor Gertrude Schmeidler. She had set up thermistors, and from across the room, he could make the temperatures go up and down. And so I took this claimed psychic, invite him out to SRI to see, see what he could do. play guitar. Not sure where to start. We had the quark detector, and so it was basically a quantum chip inside a new metal magnetic shielding, inside of a steel doer for electrical shielding, inside a superconducting shielding, the requirement being that nothing could affect this thing from the outside. So I want to see if you can affect it. He affected it unequivocally. You calling for some wheels? I'm Johnny on the spot. I'll hook you up. He stopped the oscillation. Now what turned out to be even more, quote, magical was when we asked him, you know, how do you know what to do? He said, well, all I did was look inside and then he drew out how things were related inside. It never been published. And it turned out that they were... Okay, I got stuff to do. So it was when I drew all that up and circulated around. That's when the CIA came out and my doorstep. And I said, oh, we've been looking for you. And I said, you know, why? Well, what would I do? He said, well, the Russians have been spending millions of dollars at their best institutes with their best people for years. No scientist in America even believes there's such a thing as psychokinesis or ESP or whatever. And you happen to do this experiment. And so, you know, we graduated from there to having remote viewing of super secret facilities and project titles, hidden in safes. That's how the whole program got started, ended up being a 20-year, $20 million program. I don't know what to make of all of this. I don't think any of this, to me, sounds real. Now, that said, you could imagine a one-time backwards upgrade, saying, we happen to know about aliens for a long period. We've kept it secret. We figured out the physics. The physics has different fields, we're actually able to use this, we call it psychic phenomenon so we don't have to give our secrets away. You can imagine a complete reworking of reality. Without that real working of reality, I would say this is BS. Yeah. What, would, what would be your best guess, assuming you think, because you have levered a lot of your life into parapsychology, and you've levered a lot of your life into physics, how would you reconcile physics with parapsychology, which you kind of realize is a, you know, 64 million dollar question, but what would be your best guess? Do you have any well, we, 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 we can definitely rule out that it's EM brainwaves. Because we put some of our remote viewers in submarines, we put them to the bottom of the ocean, and we got some of our best results. In fact, the remote viewers in the submarines said, boy, we look quiet. Yeah. I mean, if I think about it in terms of telescopy, right, for every long range field, we now have a telescope. So we have optical and radio telescopes for photons. We have neutrino telescopes, which is actually matter rather than force. We know that neutrinos can zip through a planet and not even notice it was there. And then we have gravitational telescopes, which are more wider. And the weak force is going to be super short range, super weak, because it's effectively massive. We have interesting uh, forces in the EM. Sorry, when, when I think about EM, I'm thinking. You're yeah, including vector scale. Oh, yes. Okay. Nobody, nobody, everybody's moved on to vector. 
I didn't want to call it vectors, but I just kind of they're, they're different con connections and fibers. And then you have this issue of gravitation with LIGO. Right. Right? So we can you can pick up super long range stuff from colliding black holes by now measuring right. gravity waves. Gluons aren't gonna do much for you, quarks aren't gonna do much for you. These are the fields that really give us information from distant galaxies. And then there's the question of, are you talking about a material world that we don't yet know? Or, or material effects that is part of the material where we do know. Where, where the, somehow we haven't... For example, entanglement. I mean, you have all these... But, but you know the usual uh, issues about it not being useful to communicate information. You have, you have this bizarre non-locality entanglement. But you can't use it for FTL for faster than light communication, mm -hmm. right? Right, so the two, two events are space-like separated. Uh, you're not, so far as we know, there's no means of tricking. You need something, huh? Uh, One of your rides? No Let me know. It. Right. Yeah, so this but is it the, happens. Get a light, weirdo. Well, I'm, I'm struggling, to be <laughs> honest, to say, just to put it mildly. And, I don't like losing to Jesse. It's horrible losing him on UFOs. I don't want to lose to him a second time. <laughs> um, but I guess what the question is, really, you don't have a lot of room to move. You either have to postulate new physics. You have to say that there are new effects like the Paranoff bone that we didn't understand or the physics that we already know, but we haven't unpacked them. Or you have to say this isn't material, that there's, uh, there are angels and demons and spirits that... Uh, that don't conform to our understanding. Everything here is bold. There's nothing that simply... I right, I'll get back to work. Yeah, we, we saw this effect that was robust. So, uh, for me, I, I've looked into the Stargate stuff, and, I, and I've talked to you a decent amount. My conclusion is that there is something there, and yet it feels like there are a lot of near misses as well, and it seems very hard to instrumentalize and scale up. There were plenty of times when we produced really good data, mm -hmm. and, and oh God, to be no, fair, no, there were plenty of times when we failed. You don't understand the causal mechanism, then you're going to have repeatability issues. Is there, is there like a part of the brain, like so, is the, the Penrose thing, which is probably wrong, but, you know, this idea that we wrote in the Emperor's New Mind, that the microtubules, um, I guess that was the fault of the Emperor's New Mind with Hameroff, the microtubules are a quantum sensor that collapses the wave function in the United States. Yeah, you have I some have some sympathy for going along that direction. So you think there's some sort of quantum sensor in the brain? Do you have a top candidate for the specific structure? Or? I can't rule it out. I mean, they sort of started from a very fundamental thing, and that is, if you can get rid of consciousness by using an anesthetic, then however you're doing it must have something to do with consciousness. If this effect exists, why is it classified and why is the government well, where is it in the stock market? Well there are little viewers who use it on the stock market. So like the class the good example is that you guys try, try to start a hedge fund with you know just trading solar futures and you made something like 260k and I think scaling it beyond that seemed to be a big a big challenge. It was only a challenge because I didn't have the time to, to do it. I mean our particular thing. I got it. I mean, I want, I want to be polite, but I also want to be aggressive. Sure. My experience with money tells me that you can win over any skeptic very quickly if you can just shove millions of dollars into their pocket by arbitraging the skepticism. Okay, let me let me tell you how to do it, and you just go do it. It's really easy, actually. <laughs> I know. I know some people with capital. Right. <laughs> Just have somebody pick a couple of objects, hey. have them label, man. mark it up, mark it down, um, and they're going to show you how they call it right the now. Down, mark it down. Down. I'm on the clock. The what you want? Some wheels? Based on that description, they can go back, and the next day, uh, I'll bring it to you. Get, get money. We ran 70 30 instead of 50 50. And so it was two steps forward, one step backward, two steps forward. And that's, and that's how we downed him. That's how we got the $260,000, which is why did you stop? Well, the reason I stopped was I was already working, uh, frankly, 24 hours a day on, on, on training the Army and Cumberland officers. And so I was exhausted after 30 days of doing this. Sorry. But if you want to do it, feel free to do it. I've, I've told you how to do it, so you can just go do it. Wouldn't it be cool to have one keyboard that keeps up with you? Apex Pro Mini, 60% form factor, 100% union disc. Always
is on point with OmniPoint 2.0 switches. The fastest switch there. Okay. Oh, I'm having a very surreal experience. For a large portion of the conversation, you seem absolutely cogent, coherent, well-informed, well-spoken. And then there's this part that just doesn't make any effing sense. And this is the part that doesn't make any effing sense. Rolling up in a Bugatti to your Gulfstream to fly to your island is a very powerful argument that you know what you're talking about. Bitcoin community is consulted by the economists, they've been laughed at by financiers, and they have a phrase which I really detest, but I think you need to hear it. And it's called number go up. And number go up means that when you're talking to a, an esteemed professor of economics or finance, and they're telling you that you're an idiot, and you say, well, why don't you visit me at the Yellowstone Club? I'll, I'll, I'll send the jet around for you. Number go up is an incredibly powerful argument because of human greed and avarice. Okay, I, th I think we made this point. What do you think about, you know, when we hear that they're unidentified aerial phenomena, that's one thing. But then when somebody like Bob Lazar comes out and says that he worked at a place called S4, which is a part of Area 51, on uh, alien reproduction vehicles, literally reverse engineering crashed UFOs, what are we supposed to make of things like that? Well, I mean, I'm skeptical. Mm -hmm. The yeah. degree behind the scenes, we can check on his clearances and so on. I, mean, I have reason to be skeptical, so I, I can't absolutely rule things out because everything can be manipulated. Sure. If you've looked at the magnesium bismuth piece from Roswell, which was, I guess, a, a, a grandfather, he was a, a colonel in the Roswell cleanup collection. This was sort of left in a safe, right. and the grandson found it. You do material analysis on this bismuth magnesium piece. The magnesium ratios were way off. I mean, not even close to being natural. It can micro-size micro waveguides uh, for terrorist, terrorist channels, yeah. To me, only data counts. Mm -hmm. I have no idea whether this story of somebody finding it in his grandfather's diary and so on is true or not. So the only data I have is this piece of material. And does it have any unusual properties that, that are interesting? Well, I can check that out, and I found out that it did have this miniaturization of waveguide channels well below wavelength, which is quite an accomplishment. But once you realize how many materials work, you, you can do that. So, so, so that was interesting. <laughs> You're through to your garage. You uh, need me to bring you a ride? People uh, have been through the experience of contact, whether or not that's completely in their head or a government-induced... Uh, I'll get there as soon as I can. What? I no longer believe that this is just a bunch of people looking for attention. Mm -hmm. Well, it's it could be a psyop. That's what I'm saying. That, that, that makes it the most interesting thing in the world because it's either the best savior to force rate psyops. It's up there in terms of... You know, the, the, the intersection between interesting and effective, yeah. it's good. How we really appreciate you being here. Eric, thank you for co-hosting. You were a great uh, co-host. You asked a lot of questions that I could not. Jesse, I really appreciate what you're doing, trying to get this issue out in front of the public and uh, get it taken seriously and putting it on a, you know, its best foot forward. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, appreciate it. It's a terrific conversation. It's, it's always very uh, exciting to, you know, delve into these things. So. Yeah, I, I think so too. And yeah. I think there are a lot of loose threads, but uh, to be continued. A lot of loose threads. Yeah. We'll, ch we'll chase them all. Okay, sounds okay. good. Thanks for having me. This show is slightly different from my other work. Um, Mike, can you hear me okay? My, my audio just dropped a little bit. Yep. You know, for those who know me from Empire Files and Media Roots Radio, yeah, Empire Files is very enlightening. It can also be very heavy. Media Roots Radio is more of a cathartic outlet for me. And for the last few years, I've felt really siloed off, honestly, into this kind of dark black hole of information. And I started to feel like I was reorganizing my brain to override other important things that make me a more dimensional person. <laughs> One of the things I miss most about you my calling for some wheels? Was being I'm Johnny on the spot. Just I'll hook you up. Just a range of topics and speak to interesting people that dosed me one way or another. 
really quickly, what does oh, being I mean, dosed mean? Money. No, I'm not talking about dropping acid, although that is one way to do it. What? It's okay, much more broad a than a nod to psychedelics. Dosed is a reimagination, if you will, of being red pilled, which is kind of a passe yeah, term that now applies to partisan politics. For me, dosed really just means having an epiphany, learning something that changes the way you view the world, deepens your perspective and understanding, and it really can apply to it's anything. coming at you. Art, science, I'll get back to it then. Of course, politics. So keep this in mind when you call in later in the episode to share what is dosed you. That's why I'm so excited to have the founder of the Zeitgeist Movement, author of the new human rights movement, host of the podcast Revolution Now, and the creator of the new-ish epic mixed genre film, Inner Reflections, Peter Joseph, on Dosed Today. Peter, I am so happy to have you with us. Hey, Abby and Mike, thank you very much. I appreciate that. And congratulations on the new uh, the new communicative venture. I like it. It's a great style. Good. <laughs> So, Peter, I'm so happy that you are my first guest on this show because, you know, not only do I think you're a brilliant visionary and one of the most important intellectuals of our time, your work has completely dosed the fuck out of me over and over and over again throughout my life. It's helped radicalize me as a young adult, it set me on the path I am today, and it continues to guide my understanding of the world and my place in it. I mean, let's just go back to Zeitgeist. I know that you only intended it as this artistic expression and nothing more, but for people who don't really know the profound influence that this film had, I mean, the original Zeitgeist was so transformative for so many. Look, this was seen not only a million times, not only 10 million or 100 million, I mean, potentially, we're talking about maybe a billion people that um, have caught wind of the themes that you presented in Zeitgeist, uh, Peter, and it's just incredible. I mean, it was something so much bigger than you, of course, but I think that it really spoke to this... What you need, boss? Some wheels? Zeitgeist. I can bring them around. The Bush era was such an intense time. This film captured this kind of collective outrage that had built up, I think, I around the political moment. and media establishments post 9-11. It's on the way! Yeah, sure. You know, the religion part was mind-blowing, even though I didn't grow up religious. And it was dropped at a time when videos became viral on their own, believe it or not, when algorithms didn't drive what is and what is not seen. And the ultra-viral nature of that movie was completely organic, I and mean, clearly it provided something that people were very much craving at that moment in time. And then, of course, you continued the series with the second and third equally fascinating additions, and are actually working on the fourth chapter now. But following your trajectory, your work thereafter, especially the new human rights movement, synthesized so much for me about the structural nature of our problems, and I've really never heard anyone give a more convincing case against capitalism, which of course we're going to focus on. But first, Peter, I think our audience would really be interested to know, what is an early dosed moment for you? Well, first, I appreciate the kind words and the introduction. And Zeitgeist, of course, was a very strange moment because it wasn't intended, as you pointed out. Most people, when they put forward a communicative work, they have a strategy in mind to release it and to hope people pay attention to it. And usually there's an agenda of some kind, often monetary for folks. And that film had none of that and wasn't even supposed to be released at all. So that's put that aside for the moment. In terms of your question, which we can circle back around to Zeitgeist, uh, you know, I've been pondering the, the dosed premise all day uh, as I thought about your, your uh, podcast. You need something, here. huh? When he arrives, let me know. You know. The sequence of events that sort of paints the picture or the structure of what I am at this point in time. And it's less of a spontaneous thing and more of a gradual thing. Nothing, nothing particularly revelatory in, in an immediate sense. But I did recall this one moment when I was a kid, and I think this is just something that maybe other people might have experienced at some point. When I was maybe seven or so, and I was turning this corner with my mother in a car, and the sun was blazing in, and the American I'll bring it South by. 
Okay, I, I got stuff to do. Life, uh, a sense of realization or a sense of questioning of what the fuck am I? Like, <laughs> what am I? Like, I, I, I scared the shit out of my mother because like, so I started asking her all these ridiculous philosophical questions and she's sitting there staring at me. Um, and, it, and, and it was one of those things I related to uh, what's called theory of mind. It's not directly related, but I don't know if you're aware of this as a mom. When your kid gets to be between three and five, you're the child will start to realize that other organisms have thinking processes that are different from their own, that there's an autonomy to, there's an autonomousness to other living things, and that's called theory of mind, and this was kind of an existential theory of mind. I'll never forget that memory, though, it really stuck with me, and then I kind of, you know, went through the normal uh, childhood, more or less, um, had you know, poverty experiences that still stick in my mind. Of course, my mother was a social worker. She dealt with people in poverty and deprivation. So I had a lot of feedback from that world, uh, both academically and in my normal rural existence, which was a, a, a pretty poor area. And I was fortunate, and I think the, the inflection point for me was really the, the privilege of going to a collective arts school, an international arts school, when I was about 13 years old up through up through high school and then off to college in New York, uh, which I eventually dropped out of. But in that period of time, I went to this art school in the American South. I was detached away from the traditional forms, the traditional educational process, the rote learning, and of course the homogeneity of the American South, which, you know, it's just like any place that isn't super metropolitan. You have a kind of general culture. It tends to get stagnant and all of that. You, racism and bigotry and all those things that you will eventually absorb as a child if you're not exposed to other things. So I went to this art school as a musician and I got to meet tons of people across the whole spectrum of creativity and of course lifestyle and everything else. And that was a very important point, which is why I always encourage any, anyone out there raising kids to, you know, the arts and the sciences go together as one and you have to start to get that into people's consciousness at the earliest age so it creates a flexibility in their understanding. I was very fortunate to have that, I think, anyway. At least that's what I attributed to. So then we jump ahead to, uh, like, New York. I'm living in New York, and I'm, I'm literally working as, as I, after I dropped out of the conservatory there because I didn't want to be an orchestral musician. I was I'm on the system, clock. Um, what you want? Some wheels? Uh, that was my focus. So I had to moonlight in all sorts of other ways as I tried to build a career in music. And I started working as a... I say I worked on Wall Street, not literally, even though I was, you know, in New York City. I study with uh, actual traders uh, in this period of time in my early 20s trying to find a way basically to break away from the hierarchies of uh, society intuitively. I don't really even know what I was thinking at that time. I just knew I didn't want to have a boss. And <laughs> it's, yeah, it's just a common reaction. In fact, a lot of these people you meet in the trading world were like me. They don't understand what they're doing in the darkness of what they're part of, which I'll get to in a moment. This is another important collection point for me. Uh, but they, they, it's really a reaction not to have to deal with the corporate structure. That's why people want to be independent traders. I'll bring it to you. Core I, I'll get back to work. That, which builds on its own. So I ended up doing that simultaneously working in advertising. So I had you know, these two jobs I did parallel. Two of the worst, worst things on the face of the earth as far as I'm concerned. Advertising in Wall Street. Two of the most beneficial industries. <laughs> yes, complete uh, void industries, which, again, we can, we can build upon in a, in a little while. Because uh, they are important staples to understand the character of civilization today. Uh, and getting worse and worse, unfortunately. And the evolution or the adaptation of our social system, which we can talk about more so as well. But in this environment, I started to really reflect on the social systems. Like, why am I getting paid this money to you know, create little movies for extreme wealthy people to buy, you know... $400 million penthouses in Central Park, uh, and why am I also gambling in this little arena here, which seems to have all sorts of money that comes out of nowhere, in order to just be self-serving and not contribute anything to society? Why are these two of the most lucrative industries on the face of the earth, is the question, or at least in America, which, uh, you know, is probably the face of the earth as well. And that's really what started me down the rabbit hole of starting to question what the hell is going on. And that was the period of time when I began to develop Zeitgeist as a, as a fourth occupation, so to speak. Uh, during that period of time, again, I was working three jobs, basically. And then in the evenings, I'd come back, and I would work on this little project of my own. No, no, particular, uh, no particular intent, as I said earlier. And that is when it hit in 2000, excuse me, 2007. In fact, it will almost be 15 years this summer that that film has been out, which is shocking to think about. And it was 
You're through to your garage. You uh, need me to bring you a ride? Here's the funny thing. If, you, if you're familiar with New York City, you have a thing called the Village Voice. And the Village Voice is a free periodical they put out with events. And I remember following at four in the morning the Village Voice buses with these uh, trucks. And I would put little cars for the zeitgeist showing in every single Village Voice, like thousands of them. And that's how ridiculous I was in promoting this thing from the grassroots level. And so on the, the six-night run, which was completely free, it was all full of tourists, believe it or not. And the, and the dynamic in the room it was only like a little you know, little 50 seat theater in Chinatown, but the dynamic was really interesting that day after day because you know, people would leave, people would come back. Uh, there was a great tension uh, in giving, you know, this is a live performance piece with me performing literally instruments with these two giant screens that showed the film simultaneously. And that was the original version of it. So wait, I'll get there as soon as I can. Long I'll long get back to it then. It was a six night run. Oh, wow. And I was just, again, I was free in Chinatown. It was like this ridiculous walk up, like a six flight walk up, this tiny little black box theater. And and so the, the thing, you know, unfolded, and it was actually you know, very interesting again. Some people hated it, obviously, and some people uh, really were into it. And I had a lot of unique inquiries. But at that point, I just gave up on it. I was like, okay, I gotta go back to my normal job. I, I shelved it. And it was at that time when Google Video came out. And this is the other interesting thing I don't think I talked about much to people regarding this, this uh, evolution. And you might remember in 2006, 2007, Google had a campaign, billboards that said, Google Zeitgeist. <laughs> what? Yeah, so remember, this was their, their kind of like TED Talk project, and they had this program they developed, I think they'd start around like 2002 or something, but it wasn't really that established yet. Maybe a little bit later, but it was Google Zeitgeist, it was very popular, I never thought about this, but... I, when that thing hit on Google Video, which was uploaded to, you know, just thrown up there, that I had no light legal clearance for that film whatsoever. <laughs> you calling for some wheels? I'm Johnny on the spot. I'll hook you up. Online, whatever. People want to watch it. It's not a big deal. I'm not selling anything, whatever. And, but Google Zeitgeist was happening simultaneously. And when that thing hit viral on Google Video, it shot my website to the very top of the search engine. So the people who literally Google Zeitgeist, they got me. <laughs> I, I hijacked <laughs> instead of Webster's dictionary. It was like, <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> I, mean, I literally hijacked their entire PR campaign because remember, it's Google Zeitgeist, and I, and so Zeitgeist. That's one of the reasons I think it got some weird kind of um, which you know I think it would have gotten momentum anyway. But I think a lot of people they Googled Zeitgeist just like they saw on that billboard, but they got you know ZeitgeistMovie.com. It was hilarious. I'm actually really surprised that Google didn't try to. Restricted, but the, the the viral nature of that was so robust that I don't think they could get away with it. And you know, internet censorship wasn't as bad as it is now, anyway. So that's how that kind of emerged. You know, I can go into more detail as to what went into that project. It's coming at you. But, uh, let's, okay, I got stuff to do. And, and you know, go from there. That's fascinating. I had no idea that that was part <laughs> of that simultaneous uh, display of Google. You know, at the time, it was kind of this egalitarian notion of you know, Google, the mantra, don't be evil, and it was like everyone can just buy into these systems, and that censorship that's on full display today just was not present at all. Um, right. And, of course, that's how these things, you know, that's how people like you and I have proliferated into, like, being people the people that we are today and having the influence and reach that we do is because we were allowed to through the mechanisms that these social media giants provided and and so it is just it's just really cynical that um they can just lock us out at any point today but you have the the argument against that well oh they're a private company so just don't violate their terms of service and you're, you'll be fine it's like well no that's not exactly right but let's go back to you know first of all props to your mom uh, I, I have no idea how she harnessed and cultivated such a be brilliant mind, Peter, but rest in power to Peter's mom, that's amazing. I can only imagine how she was uh, ping-ponging off of your, <laughs> like, awakening of, like, I'm a, I'm a conscious, sentient being that's, like, interconnected <laughs> with, with everything in the world. Um, but no, I really appreciate, like, the effort that you put into putting out, like, as just an art piece without even knowing the impact it would eventually have, like, just the amount that you did with that grassroots guerrilla marketing is, uh, is something I appreciate a lot, man. But let's go back to the stock market, right? Because you mentioned that you worked in advertising and equity trading. You know, at the same time, I had no idea that you were actually there, like, moonlighting and that you were there primarily for music, um, which makes sense. 
But you had this insider's perspective on, I guess, the scheme of, like, the stock market and how all of this operates, and it, it's just something that's kind of in the periphery. It's like we're constantly bombarded with information. It's always in the background about the stock market, always scrolling on the bottom of our TV screens, discussed by po politicians and pundit, excuse me, politicians and pundits as, like, the metric of health of our economy. But it's so fucking abstract for most Americans living paycheck to paycheck. You know, like, what even yeah. is the stock market, and what purpose does it really serve? I think the best way to describe it is as an evolution within the market system, within capitalism. So, very briefly, years ago, you had companies, the companies needed money, people would come in and they'd invest, they'd get money from the investment through dividends or profit sharing or whatever, but there was a direct, tangible relationship to somebody investing in something and getting a return based on the products or services sold. That was the way it was, slowly it morphed, where people realized they could kind of gamble on these, these certificates, these shares, and they could start to trade them amongst themselves, and they would have the price rise and fall based on the interest that was driving them effectively fear and greed. And slowly this complete detachment started to generate, which to me, frankly, is the core of the system. This is a widget-based economic system. The purpose doesn't matter. All that matters is the demand that can be generated or exists. It's no one creates something, in other words, to solve a problem that's done by proxy. If we solve a problem by proxy, that's great, but the ultimate goal of everyone is to simply make a profit. And that is an unfortunate reality we can talk about as well in general. I mean, we live in a world that so many things are governed by proxy, where you have to go through this game in order to get anything done. I mean, as a brief aside, look at the political establishment, which is completely group identified. I mean, how many votes in the U.S. Congress are straight down the party line? Why? Because they're going by proxy. It's about group versus group power dynamics. And if something good comes out of that, uh, well, then that's a side effect, because the first focus of all politicians is to maintain the integrity of their, basically, their gangs. Uh, but that's for another conversation. But that's, again, something I think about quite a bit about this proxy reality. And the economic system of markets is precisely that. So you have the widget. So that's all the stock and the commodity and Bitcoin or anything else. Anything else is in this abstraction on these exchanges is a widget that's completely detached from all reality. And it's traded in no different form or no different consequence. Well, I'll take that back. In no different meaning than Las Vegas. It's like if you turn on the news and it's NBC News, and they're talking about poverty and war, then they start talking about the craps game in Las Vegas. That's the exact equivalent thing when they bring up the goddamn stock market. The problem, though, and here's the real problem that's happened of the, over this evolution. I, again, it's a system adaptation. The system we live in changes based on the rise of technology, and the culture morphs as well. And that's something I talk a lot about in my podcast. It's very important to understand that trend, understand where we've come from and where we're going, because this kind of abstraction of nature is getting worse and worse and worse. For example, as a brief aside, uh, because the stock market is essentially a virtual casino, it invites virtual concepts back into culture, I should say arises into culture, such as, say, the fact that people are trading property in the metaverse now, as if any of it's real. So we're developing new, new nonsense, right? We're developing constant new nonsense to buy and sell, which, uh, and again, I don't like to go down these tangents, but is so deeply caustic when we're trying to solve ecological problems and solve you know, inequality problems, because the system is so perverted that if you can't find something to exploit, it's going to make something out of nothing to exploit. So you have these idiots on Wall Street creating derivatives upon derivatives, and just to put this into a more uh, social context as opposed to abstract it, what is the major driver of all of the economic collapses we've seen in the modern era? It's all linked to the financial system and the stock market. If people paid attention to that, if they paid attention to the fact that the financial system and the stock market are at the helm of every major crash that we've seen in contemporary history, they might be a little more cynical of it. Because it's not just gambling in a casino where someone can lose all their money and that's that. Everything the stock market, Wall Street, and financialization and the rise of it has done is interweave Main Street with it. So when the shenanigans of this gambling casino crashes periodically, which it will, it takes down people and lives and jobs and well-being and the earth simultaneously. So, as I said before, abolish fucking Wall Street if you want to have any little step towards sanity on this planet. Let's stop the gambling casino because it's absolutely insane and completely unnecessary. Right, and it serves just this very privileged minority <laughs> of people who are, as you just articulated, literally like gambling people's lives. 
that's what this is, and the planet is health. Yeah. Um, I want to move on to, I mean, speaking of Wall Street, you have the proximity to, of course, Times Square. Um, this is a really funny, just kind of anecdote of an English author, G.K. Chesterton. Chesterton, excuse me, when he first visited America in 1921, he went to see Times Square. Um, and I'm getting this from Chris Ryan's book called, I think it's called Amusing Ourselves to Death. Um, okay. What's that? Civilized to death. Oh, civilized to death, my bad. Sorry, Chris. Um, but Chesterton stood staring, like, at Times Square for several moments, and then when someone asked him for his thoughts, he was just like, I was just thinking how beautiful this would be if I couldn't read. <laughs> uh, and, like, I mean, it's such a dominant and completely useless industry across the world, of course, much of which originates from U.S. society, feeds off our deepest insecurities, exploits a lot of the sexual repression that's prevalent in this country, which you could go off on a tangent all day about. I mean, manifests into this very over-the-top kind of Freudian displays. Also, of course, the most negative impact, other than the incessant consumerist nature of it, is just it makes people feel like shit. We're never good enough. We always want to be something and someone else in order to fit into this certain status or social group. And really, it just boils down to just we're seeing people to keep consuming at higher and higher rates to not let the economy collapse. And it just kills me to think of how many creatives are sucked into this space, wasting all of the talent, manipulating the masses into buying shit that we don't need. Right. And, you know, being, in, being somewhere like Cuba many years ago, you know, there's no ads, of course, there's just like government sponsored billboards or banners about the revolution and stuff. And there was just something incredibly profound about the absence of ads, like the ability to just give your mind the space to take in your environment without feeling commodified at every turn. Because even though you may be very aware of how dominant consumerism is on a day to day basis, it's really hard to appreciate it. And it's really hard to appreciate how much you psychically crave that kind of emptiness in order to process. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. I think you nailed it on multiple levels there. I, I was, I'll, note, excuse me, I'll note that in terms of system evolution, it's very important to recognize advertising and the rise of consumer culture as just that, an evolution, an adaptation of a system that was growing too technically efficient. So you have the Industrial Revolution, this is the dawn of mechanization and extreme uh, efficient productivity, the rise of machines and the incorporation of them, which has been very much exponential since then. And so the dilemma is how do you continue to a cyclical consumption, growth-based economy, uh, when you are able to meet needs that rapidly, especially when things aren't changing to an extent where people can kind of naturally adapt to new goods and services, this is, it took some time, and there's a, a great work called Consumer's Republic that I recommend, and this chronicles uh, this rise of consumerism uh, quite well in terms of this dramatic change in America, which, of course, through colonialism spread across the world. Uh, but then again, it's still embedded entirely within the market system. In other words, it's completely expected. So you have this, this, this industrial revolution, and I think John hey, Maynard hey, Keynes, you know, the classic economist, Say what you want about his views. He wrote yes, an essay LA. a you number of times. Well, what do you mean by the bank account? Anyway, in the 1930s, wrote an essay. Uh, in this what do you time, need, boss? Some wheels? I can bring them around. Of what will happen in the future. And that is, ideally, in other words, the most common sense of what we're saying, we would adapt to the increase in surplus and abundance. Costs would drop, and people would reduce their work week. And we would eventually naturally move into what some people would consider a socialist arrangement, but I don't use that terminology, but something where the system has become so efficient, needs are being met, and and you don't need to have the way. All right, I'll get back to work. ...process as it existed before to keep society going. But we didn't go that route. Instead, the collective industry and the government got together and said we have to find a way to keep this machine going. We have too much at stake, at stake in our elitist interests and in our power interests because the corporate system is the underlying force of power politically. That is the revolving door chain that defines that effectively the political contour. Excuse me, I talked about it. And that is how we got to that point. And it's, it's very important people realize that because just so depressing that all of this abundance potential, as I alluded to before, you know, we're trying to market, you know, 
virtual space in the metaverse and sell land and sneakers that don't exist. This is all an extension of this sickness of trying to create more and more stuff for people to consume in the interest to keep the machine going. And that is one of the most tragic trajectories uh, we've been on for a while, obviously destroying human psychology and the Earth. And it, it's just going to get worse and worse unless some type of structural change is initiated or a new culture is born that can deeply reject these values, uh, which is something I've been working on in terms of project planning for a while and will be featured in the new Zeitgeist film, but I won't go down that road today. <laughs> I mean, the metaverse thing is such a fucking bizarre uh, outgrowth of what you're talking about. Um, but I mean, I guess the, the one one kind of light in all of this is that at least the people buying shit in the metaverse aren't like <laughs> producing all You need something, huh? When you ride? Plastic bottles that you buy in the metaverse are really just... It's true. <laughs> it's like, Jesus Christ, man. Maybe keeping a landlord in the metaverse. What a fucking disaster. <laughs> yeah, rent your capitalism in the metaverse. It's coming, I'm sure. <laughs> Let's I mean, move on to like these big yeah. picture ideas of your current projects because it's been really amazing to be able to follow your trajectory and have you and your work and your under understanding, like the evolution of your understanding of the world guide me and so many other people um, that really led you to the foundation of like the human rights, the new human rights movement, the structuralism, the unification theory, um, you know, and I appreciate that like you put out this ultra viral trilogy and throughout that process you yourself took on the responsibility of like well now i need to figure out the solution and not a lot of people do that <laughs> they just like to complain you know and and be the people pointing out the problems but you actually tasked yourself with figuring out how it can be solved which is unbelievable that you did that um, so I appreciate you. I'll bring it by. Me. I'll get back to it then. I synthesize all of these thoughts and philosophies in this excellent weekly podcast called Revolution Now. I highly recommend my listeners to support you and listen every week. I've learned far more from even this podcast and your book than I did through multiple years of my neoliberal indoctrination at college. Um, <laughs> absolutely. But one of the main focuses of the podcast is breaking down the kind of pillars of myths that make up our society and underpin capitalism which essentially is like the religion of the u.s empire let's talk about a couple of these you know and a lot of these kind of synchronize with the myths of human behavior especially modern human civilization as well like let's just start with the idea that competition is the basis of all innovation and we wouldn't have all of what we do today if the incentives weren't there to create them capitalism provides those incentives yeah that is the most cliche libertarian comment on the role and, and of course defense of, of competitive behavior which usually people find offensive you know, and rightfully so uh, the very basis of a competitive posture is to seek advantage over someone else for your own personal gain which if i remember back from kindergarten that's usually not the way you're supposed to behave um, so you know this this mythology has been around for a very long time and i'll just jump to the end point the competitive nature of innovation in our society is actually a completely destructive force it's what it's done is it's created an interest to innovate just through proxy and once again just innovate for the sake of innovation in the hope to achieve market share because everyone is in the exact same scarcity oriented scarcity exploiting game you're forced in some capacity you can call yourself an entrepreneur or whatever uh, you're forced to do something to make money therefore you want to come up with something you want to you want to you, you know get people to jump on board with something new that's why we have coffee cups that are connected to your iphone you can control the temperature yeah, of the just coffee watch cup. shark tank if you want to see the useless shit that people right. are just producing on a day-to-day -day basis to just try to like make money and it's insulting it is and you know the competitive thing it, it, it's got so many different levels of mythology first of all there's that fundamental thing if you want to live on a finite planet and coexist peacefully with people, you need a more minimalistic attitude. You don't want to be driving towards using more of the Earth's resources simply because that's what you need to do for economic income. That's insane. To keep up with the Joneses psychologically or just to get income coming because there are other people fighting for fighting for your job. I mean, competition and war, effectively, since you know the war in Ukraine is this big shadow over the entire world right now, let's remember the entire structure of our society is premised as if we're in the jungle, but we're not. 
We're not in the jungle. We've built a structure where every human being is fighting for each other for market share and for work, it's like as, as corporations are. Nation states are fighting with each other to maintain dominance to effectively geostrategic economic strategy in order to you know, to keep their sub-vassals in order and in, in the network of national classism, which we've talked about before, which we can touch upon again if you like. And we've basically, long story short, we have this entire nasty arrangement of everything against everything else. And it's built into the very philosophy since the Neolithic Revolution. Thomas Hall, Hobbes, excuse me, the great father of Western philosophy, stated outright, I don't remember it verbatim, that, you know, this is the nature of man. We are competitive and ruthless beasts, and that's just what we do. And then we're not going to, you know, come anything away from that. Which, by the way, if that is actually true, then we might as well just kill ourselves right now. To think that we are fundamentally this way and that the world that we see around us is fundamentally who we are, like in the Jordan Peterson perspective, yeah, like, right, we're mirroring. We might as well, that means we are literally committing suicide as an entire civilization. I don't think nature, anywhere in nature's dialogue, uh, uh, anywhere in nature's programming, has it come up with a organism that just does that. So clearly we in our half-conscious state are creating this circumstance by introducing structures and processes that are completely incompatible with what's required to survive, hence going back to this competitive neuroses, which to me is just deeply, deeply problematic, uh, needless to say. And there's another thing I want to mention about that. Yeah, competitive self-regulation, this isn't one of the other libertarian things. They, they say, well, competition isn't just about you know, people fighting for innovation, it's also how we regulate the society. And unfortunately, that is just as detrimental because competitive self-regulation isn't just something that says, oh, well, we weed out some product that doesn't work, right? Oh, so somebody engineered something, somebody made something better, it weeds out the other product. That's competitive self-regulation. It's considered a good thing in the uh, feedback network, in the self-regulation of markets. That's the assumption that's made. But it also restricts anything new. If the competitive self-regulation says, oh, well, fuck the electric cars and renewable energy, we have this giant hydrocarbon establishment. And we're going to maintain this to the bitter end as long as we possibly can, no matter, you know, no matter what the greenhouse gas emission is, as is clearly evident. So you've got this paralysis because the establishment self-preservation born from competitive self-regulation does just that. It stifles actual progress. So the illusion that you've created just around the South that's been created, excuse me, that competition is for innovation, yeah, competition might innovate, but it also stifles dramatically. And you'll tend to find it's stifling the things that we actually need to do while innovating things that we do not need to be doing anymore. Yeah, and of course the reward um, to just the most useless inane products um, just to fill this, uh, it, not even filling a gap, because there is, it's like, it doesn't provide any sort of utility whatsoever for things that we actually need. And I love that you mentioned Jordan Peterson because this is really like I call it status quoism. It's like right. an ideolog an ideology that just endorses the status quo. It's like, well, this is just the way it is. Like looking back at like all of human civilization and just somehow comparing uh, the evolution of of humans to basically ants or bees or something and being like, yep, right. like all the hierarchies that are just natural. Like this is just we just have to reinforce what we know to be true because of how fucking ant colonies operate. It's it's really strange. Um, well, yeah, and he's, he's really unraveling lately, so maybe like maybe <laughs> less people will think of him as like some sort of guru. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, that's um, a whole other subject. But I'll just comment to follow up real briefly yeah. that, that uh, there is plenty of empirical evidence that humans collaborate extremely well in proper conditions. When you, you, know, you look at the military, the military is a war machine, two groups against another group, but within it, there's great camaraderie, deeply collaborative structure. So you have this constant... This constant You're through to your garage. You, uh, you need me to control. bring you a ride? ...in terms of human behavior, it's the structure that we're living in. The chimpanzees and bonobos are the best analogs. I think I've described this to you before. I'll just do it very briefly for your audience. Okay, you know, I got stuff to do. Bonobos are virtually genetically identical, at least they were, and bonobos are the most genetically identical identical to humans and primate species. Many, many millions of years ago, I believe there was a, a river that formed that divided what was one species, and they turned into chimpanzees on one side and bonobos on the other. The chimpanzee's exposure was to very harsh desert culture, so to speak, or excuse me, it was a desert culture that was generated. By the way, this mirrors uh, human evolution, too, but I won't go down that road in terms of desert versus rainforest cultures. But this is basically uh, the equivalency on the analog primate level. 
And so chimpanzees grew up in harsh desert, scarcity environments, very organized, warring, violence, and all the tendencies that we kind of recognize. Okay, well, that just must be our human, human nature as well. And then you have the bonobos, which have a very different evolution in lush rainforest style regions with great abundance. And they do not have rates of violence, and they have very different problem solving mechanisms, very different hierarchical arrangements. In some cases, the females are in the hierarchy, very flexible, very strange. It's completely anomalous compared to the chimpanzees. So what that means to us is that if we can create a social structure, which we can, that actually allows for abundance, allows for an ease of stress, I mean, in our society today, because it's, again, a scarcely exploitative society, without fail, it's like you have no way to work around it, the entire premise of the economy is based on exploiting scarcity, not harnessing abundance. If you have um, an, a society that's that's doing that to you, you're constantly pinging your amygdala in your brain because you're the stress and the fear of your life. Because you know, everyone's living paycheck to paycheck to one degree or another. I live project to project. I have no idea if another project that will do will ever you know, allow me to survive for the next couple of years. We have no sense of security. And that is a deeply sick thing to do to, uh, to a culture because it builds neuroses. And that, I think, really defines that culture of competition and sports UFC, it's this cultural amalgamation of this tension that's been building for so long because of this sense of fear that we constantly have in our surroundings and our insecurity, survival-wise, and we've literally developed a neurotic culture. And that's one of the most dangerous things to try and overcome. In fact, I'll just say this to conclude that point. The, 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 found, excuse me, the, uh, the foundation, the groundwork of what has created patterns of institutional behavior, of culture, and so forth, you know, most likely since the Neolithic Revolution. That's the core inflection point in my mind. The discovery of agriculture created the divisions of society. We, we developed property and this whole evolution that emerged. Um, this has developed a culture which is that much harder to get past. It's kind of like um, inner city gangs. We know that the, the deprivation uh, has created inner city gangs. It, it exists. These people have come, and in many cases, minorities that have come from deep oppression over generations, and they develop gangs. But what happens after that? It's, not, it's no longer about survival after a certain point. It's about a culture. So a culture of gang behavior. And then you have generations of people that might be able to get out of the you know, problem of the scarcity that originally started this, but they've manifested the culture. And this is by far the most troubling aspect of what we've become as a species in modern civilization. We are moving away from all the origin points that we can understand as to why we are the way we are, and we're developing a new neurotic, uh, enveloping state that we have forgotten why we even are the way we are, building this, this, this snowballing feedback loop towards our demise. So that's really troubling, and that's why when people often ask me, like, well, a resource-based economy, why do this happen? Like, why can't happen if this person did this? There's all these what-ifs, because most, most notoriously, people are locked into a world where they only know what they see. I'm on the clock. What you want? Some wheels? Any sense of causality as to why things have come to where they are. And that's, you know, that's the fundamental problem of the activist community. And I'm not putting down activists. I, anyone that actually has the courage to be an activist to go out there and buck the system on any level should be, you know, should be prideful and should be respected. But the fundamental philosophy of activism has been built into this superficiality where we don't have any kind of true systemic structural sense of how we got to where we are or what the driving dynamics are that keep us there. I'll bring it and to you. We, you know, I, I'll get that. back to work. It's literally just you know shooting darts. We're just be attacking groups and attacking politicians and people and thinking that people are the problem when, uh, when people actually are not the problem. We are, we are throughputs in this reality and there is something that has come before us. As much as we like to believe that we have our free will, and to an extent we do, we have to remember that everything we think and know was taught to us, everything that we associate with has been conditioned into us. And that type of awareness is still very, very lacking. That's basically the sociological foundation, again, of the podcast I put forward, and the way I approach all problem solving, going back to the point about it, which, and just to conclude my rambling, is so difficult. It's so difficult to talk about the sociological level because people really just want to believe that they can get rid of some group or some institution and everything will be fine. But that's just not the way it's, that's not the way it is. It's unfortunate. Right. I mean, it, especially because our system today is not actually based on scarcity anymore. I mean, it, it, we live in a time of overabundance, which manifests into all of these disturbing 
aspects that you're describing now, and I mean the sociological aspect of kind of the historical amnesia of where we were a hundred years ago in this country, you know, the militant labor movement, all the things that advanced, the menial uh, social gains that have been stripped down ever since. I mean, it, the fact that Bernie Sanders was considered this revolutionary figure when really he just kind of mirrored what the New Deal. Um, right. It's a lot of ignorance, deep-seated ignorance, and then of course it manifests into very disturbing ways where, you know, this conspiracism to explain away everything, this kind of, uh, this um, dysfunctionality, really, when it comes to understanding basic concepts. I mean, look at, like, I mean, it, it manifests, of course, with different partisan lenses, but, um, you know, something like Russiagate, for example, to explain away why Donald Trump won in our alleged democracy, and then you had kind of the other camp falling prey to the QAnon, uh, kind of cult-like type thinking. I know that you don't like to use that word, but it really is, uh, it, it's so fascinating to see how these things play out. And you've talked about this too, like this alienation, um, going back to the concept of, you know, the communal aspect of human civilization and how it's progressed, and especially after I had a child, and realizing that whole theme of like it takes a village it, it really does it right. really applies to everything in life how you need a support system to not feel like you're completely overwhelmed and atomized and just completely left to fend for yourself and it really does feel completely debilitating and i think that as we navigate the um, the landscape of information right now, there is this tendency to have this kind of reflexive contrarianism when you're looking at something like an establishment narrative because of, of the myth-making, because of the pathological lying on behalf of politicians. And, for example, you mentioned the war in Ukraine. This complicated geopolitical situation has been truncated into, like, a cartoon binary. You know, Putin is only doing this because he's evil and we're good and Zelensky's a hero and you know, and then you have the mass censorship effect, this infantilizing notion of, um, you know, that we're children and we need to be, have our reality curated for us by tech giants, and it's just really sad because it breeds this deep institutional distrust, which you would hope would manifest into something beneficial, that, okay, we all know that the system is failing us, it's not serving us, and we all know that politicians and media are lying, so where do we go from there? But people are just increasingly losing their grip on reality, and the magical thinking is resonating more and more, despite the access to information, Peter. Yeah. I, it, it is counterintuitive. Uh, it's very interesting. I like how you used the phrase, I think it was reflexive contrarianism, is that what you said? Yeah. Because I use the phrase impulsive skepticism. <laughs> Those are synonymous. Uh, remember the old um, Frederick Douglass quote? paraphrase, you know, any group of people made to feel that there is an active conspiracy against them, made to feel is the operant, you know, phrase there, uh, no persons or property will be safe. And you have an entire society that's predicated effectively on exploitation, one way or another, no matter how people want to spin that, it's still an exploitative society, that is exactly what the modus operandi is, and you're going to have tremendous in a disadvantage, and in fact it's a mathematical result, that you're going to have vast class inequality. This has been modeled by computer scientists. You put the market system into a computer, you put the proper parameters in, you allocate a certain amount of money, forget, you know, forget the debt-based currency or whatever, forget all the, the layers of argument that creates inequality on this planet, the very structure of markets will separate uh, the, the rich minority from the poor majority. It's literally inevitable, which is why government is the only kind of, you know, uh, apparatus we have to try and circumvent that. And again, I won't keep deviating down these tangents, but the reason, of course, the government fails to regulate inequality is because the government is compromised by the same power figures and by nature of the structure. The political establishment we have today is built upon the economic establishment and not the other way around. That's a very common misconception people have. They think politics is the highest order, especially in democracy, and it's through that we change what's below. Excuse me, we change what, whatever happens, including the economy, but what is below is actually more powerful because you're dealing with the very incentives required for survival and the kind of blinkering and pathology that's created with people in power. Um, it's like that scene in Inner Reflections where I have this, this 
kind of cliche scene where this guy gives a speech about how no billionaires are helping him resolve poverty. But I really believe that when people reach that kind of status of wealth attainment, that their brains, on average, become malformed. Their values become distorted. <laughs> I really believe this. It's actually statistically shown. You know, University of California uh, did a bunch of studies. Um, I'm sure plenty of other people have done it as well, regarding what happens to people when they get more more uh, economic benefit and their, their personality changes. It's not a far-fetched thing. It's not universal, but you know, they're more rude, they cheat more. It's like a, it's basically Donald Trump. It's like everything that Donald Trump is uh, is an amalgamation of the psychology of the system that's embedded inside of them. So um, I completely forgot what the hell I was going with that. Can you mind reminding me? No, yeah. I mean, I mean, let me jump in here and maybe yeah. read off of this. I mean. <laughs> It, it's, yeah, like you said, I mean, there's this tendency to think that we can vote with our dollar. Like, we have the power as the consumer, but, like, no, we don't. The, the monopolization of, cap, like, monopoly capitalism has completely consolidated almost every single industry to the point where, like, I, um, these brands own everything. It's impossible to vote with your dollar or even boycott certain corporations for, like, unethical practices or human rights abuses. And going back to that fallacy that the market will self-regulate, those in power of the corporations, those in power of the lawmaking, will not be incentivized to do the right thing. They will always kick the can down to the next yeah. generation out of self-preservation of status and privilege. And even if one CEO or politician did want to change direction, they'd be kicked out of the club. Yeah. The machine's too big for one cog to change course. Absolutely. The short-term view at the long-term expense is absolutely uh, the way all things are approached. Most CEOs know they're not going to be around forever. They just want to do what they can to get their big bonus and to have a good reputation with the company and so on and so on. And that is that is a very big problem, absolutely. I, the voting with your dollar thing is funny to me because the, the joke is inside of it. <laughs> well, of course people vote with a dollar. You know why? Because the billionaires clearly have more power than everybody else. Yeah, yeah vote with your dollar. Vote with your dollar. Yeah. I'm not going to get very far. It's really hilarious, and especially going back to the activist community. Again, I appreciate the idea of boycotting this and that. Uh, there is a small effect that it has, but the fact that it's propped up as if this is the method of social change is, of course, uh, just way too weak to be acknowledged. Um, but I, I just, I, real briefly, I, re I remember what I was going to say uh, yeah, okay. regarding prior, and that was the fact that conspiracy culture is something we're addressing since we brought up Zeitgeist. It has all sorts of unique interpretations on that level. The the conspiracy element is is we've reached this point of impulsive skepticism and a complete detachment from reality where people don't even have a framework of understanding. Uh, I, you know, a lot of people look at the, the new kind of QAnon Trumpian folks with a great deal of derision, and rightfully so, but at the same time, you have to feel bad for them because they don't, they haven't been given the tools to think properly, and they have been deeply, deeply molded by a group think, uh, effectively cultish mentality. So we've, we've adapted a society now with all this wonderful information that is so prolific, and yet it's so overwhelming that we have pockets and bubbles. And now people can go to the internet and they can see only what they want to see. They can verify their own bias as opposed to you know, finding information that challenges them. The social media architecture is built precisely the same way. So all these different um, confluences have come together to really frighteningly detach uh, society like a bubbles of thought that you think were long gone like people think the earth was flat you know with the exception of say like old religious communities now you have this like bewildering youth culture that believes this stuff and they pride themselves in it and they have a whole little fun group of people that you know go to little conferences and they discuss all the dynamics of the earth flat. like it's truly it's truly mind-numbing when you think about this there's one more thing that i think is a is an outgrowth of the cultural neuroses that and unfortunately keeps the cynicism in my mind when I think about avenues for social change. Like, how do you get a hold of something like that when it's flying so far off the handle? When, when Alex Jones is literally being embraced on Fox News? Like, how do you... We, we've reached a very, very tragic point when it comes to the evolution of disinformation and just complete confusion. And I definitely uh, worry about that. Uh, well, it's also like mainstreaming... Um kind of like partisan belief, like partisan conspiracism. I don't even know if that makes sense. It's like weird. All of the QAnon kind of weird mentality that we're talking about has been kind of filtered and almost emboldened aspects of like the ruling class. Whereas, you know, this kind of deep, um, like historic understanding of like what is the deep state, this kind of more kind of left, I guess you could say, critique 
of power and capital and um and that seems to be lost completely because it's all been kind of funneled into this weird outgrowth of like something that reinforces capitalism in a weird way and just the the structural order that we're kind of paralyzed by um yeah you know i wanted to also i mean there's so much that i want to fucking say about the disinformation thing but i you know it is so interesting too that like you had a podcast recently where you were talking about market externalities and how like capitalism another great myth about it is the fact that it can also solve poverty or homelessness or pollution and it reminds me of you know being at cop 26 these annual climate negotiations and i was in scotland and it really was just one giant trade show you know every country had a booth sponsored by banks and oil companies and really every plenary and panel was just politicians and activists quote unquote talking about how corporations are going to save us net zero the concept of net zero no no no. we don't need to stop drilling we don't need to stop taking the ship from the ground we just need to offset the carbon emissions by planting a couple trees it was surreal because i just thought first of all how much money are you guys wasting patting yourselves on the back walking away with absolutely nothing done kicking the can down the road and then having you know the sea of access journalists just there for access there to climb the corporate ladder and being there surrounded by oil lobbyists by the way that was like the largest contingent out of the entire uh the entire um cop 26 was oil lobbyists of course but i remember asking you know i got i got a i got a chance to ask nancy pelosi a question she only called on me because i was a woman it was the one time in my life that identity politics worked in my favor but (laughs) it was incredible because i asked her about you know how can we take net zero seriously how is any of this you know not just a complete joke if you're not talking about the elephant in the room which of course the fact that they don't even count carbon emissions from any military in the world and her answer was really instructive and very disturbing and then she basically just talked about how they need the military they need a bigger and and stronger military peter a because the oceans are going to rise so we need a bigger navy and b we need the military to mitigate like the uh the instability that will arise from the effects of climate change so kind of in a disturbing fashion she was kind of hinting at the fact that we need a stronger military to prevent the influx of refugees coming in this country like we need that ultra security state to crack down on on just the effects and and it was kind of just throwing their hands up in the air being like look this is inevitable and we're going to need the military to mitigate the worst effects of climate change and it brings me back to the point of this notion that regulatory bodies like don't serve a purpose that they need to you know it was only due to this massive militant labor movement that forced the hand of government to curb the unregulated nature of corporations to pollute at will and now these agencies have been totally captured by corporate power and they just exist now to help shield them from accountability the supreme court was recently hearing a case to severely strangle the epa's ability to address climate change and meanwhile, Peter, the IPCC just came out with a final warning. Like these scientists here in LA just chain themselves to, you know, I don't even know what bank it was. All of them are culpable. But like just saying, I mean, really doing kind of militant action here, scientists, because no one's listening to them. And I don't, I don't even know where I'm going with this. But if you want to comment on any of that, absolutely. Uh, first, I think the, the Pelosi thing is so great and, and it's hilarity because what she described to you is one of the central problems of the entire system is that we're creating problems and that we're trying to create solutions to those problems which continue to create more of the same problems uh, this could be talked about with war in general uh, you know how many bombs the old joke of like how many terrorists will this new bomb bring <laughs> because you know where you ferment this kind of reactionism you know, oil. Obviously, the U.S. military be an enormous polluter. And what? Oh, we're gonna we're gonna still gonna need we're gonna pollute the environment more so, and we're gonna cause instability. But we're gonna need the military that uses that oil to solve the instability. So you see the ridiculousness of the reinforcing feedback groups, and that that's a whole other subject. And that's why um, that's why again I'm cynical on the nature of, of what we're doing right now in terms of problem resolution, because there are some really powerful feedback groups, and it's very very difficult to overcome, which we can talk more about. Um, in fact, let me just address something real fast since I yeah. jumped on that. The, the three major defining problems that people need to remember when it comes to, to markets and market capitalism as it's evolved, as it's adapted up into the modern age. 
There's a background to it I won't go into in terms of why they are the way they are and how they were less severe historically. I won't go into all of that. But the first has to do with the ecological crisis and the fact the system requires growth. It requires consumption and growth. A lot of people right now in the deep growth communities are arguing that we can have this kind of market structure and we can create variations of it to not need the growth economy, which is completely ridiculous. You, you, the system, the system's growth mechanisms are based again on the constant need for consumption to keep people employed, the self-regulation, the competitive self-regulation, which also interplays with that because these companies are constantly trying to outdo each other. Therefore, they want to get more capital expansion. They will want to get more employees, more land. There's a threshold, of course. Let's look at Amazon. Amazon has slowly wiped out some of the other companies just because they have the resources to do it. It becomes its own feedback loop once again because the bigger they get, the cheaper the cost becomes and so on. Then the third issue related to the inevitability of a growth economy is we still maintain for thousands of years, and it's not, uh, it's not intrinsic to the nature of our money exactly, it's intrinsic to the system, we maintain a debt-based monetary system. And that system produces more interest than can be solved in the principled money supply. As I wish more people talked about this, because it's just frightening. And no, it will not be resolved by Bitcoin for those that think it will be, because it's built into the very structure of the entire market dynamic. This debt goes back five, 6,000 years. In fact, debt existed before even currency existed. It's interesting to think about. So there's more, there's more money that has to be paid back to these banks that actually exist in nature. So that's why historically we've had debt jubilees as well, because it's, you know, even though intuitively they did that, they didn't realize it was mathematically inevitability. The fourth issue to blast through these is consumer culture, which we've manifested once again as this neurotic outcome. We've developed now a culture. People that behave a certain way, they're acquisitive, they're insatiable, they pride themselves on acquisition, they go to the mall for fun. Uh, it's just insane. And then, of course, economic stimulus, which is that fundamental thing that has to happen because of the lack of integrity of the system as a whole, just like with COVID. You have enormous amounts of economic stimulus constantly pushing the system to avoid recession. And that is a chicken that's about to come home to roost for, for the West after trillions of dollars of COVID money put in. But they never let it actually stabilize. They always put in more. It's always inching as far as they can go until, of course, a major crash happens. But then again, it just picks up right where it left off. Left off. So and, they'll, and they'll reap the benefits, of course, of the crash. Absolutely. Do. As, as I talk about in my book, every single crash always makes the wealthy more wealthy at the end of the day. I mean, COVID was more hilarious just because, you know, the, the shutdown of fundamental uh, Bank Street just left the billionaire institutions, the Jeff Bezos of the world, they, and these guys, and Tesla, they made so much money, it's outrageous, while everyone else suffered. I mean, if that isn't indicative of just how divided the class structure is and the class war, as it were, how valid that concept is, I don't know. I don't know yeah, is. there was that statistic that you probably would know because you're fucking encyclopedic memory, but of like the actual trillion dollars that was like essentially stolen from the poorest during the pandemic, and then that sure. exact same amount of money was what the richest made. <laughs> it's like yeah, literally, no, like, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I mean, and of course the channels. I mean, we can go down the rabbit hole with that. The, the way stimulus is actually introduced in society usually is through the financial system, which means these horrible hegemonic hedge funds and and various banking institutions are the ones that get this money first. They're the ones that get to play with this money before it trickles down to the rest of the economy. But that's a kind of cronyism that's built into it, but it's to be expected. And that's you know, that's one of those words I use very sparingly. Well, uh, well, especially because, yeah, no, that, that's a perfect segue of, like, people call, write this off. Because, of course, no one can agree that this is, like, the best system that we can do, right? But, but people will deflect and be like, no, 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 this is just crony capitalism. No, 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 this is just corruption. Yeah. Um, and like you said, like like that um, that call to just replace them with better people or people right. who are libertarian or people who do this and that. And, and as you point out time and again, like this is the natural gravitation right. of the competitive nature of the system. So like, you know, what stage capitalism is this? That kind of trope that you see time and again. I mean, it reminds me of... Um, to your point about how you cannot solve poverty and pollution under the system because there there is no market solution for solving the externalities that are produced from capitalism but like it reminds me of um two things a goldman sachs coming out saying you know those those private memos where they were like is curing cancer really a sustainable business model? 
You calling for some wheels? I'm Johnny on the spot. I'll hook you. Any other way other than that. And then I also just hilariously talking about Bitcoin and NFTs. This is just very dystopian, and I think an earplug <laughs> just really exemplifies where we're at. Um, the AP um, was selling an NFT, get this, of refugees on a boat in the Mediterranean that will probably fucking die, as yeah, they really? do, frequently. And, like, literally, like, I'll never forget it. a news organization selling an NFT being like, all right, NFT's up, guys, like, bidding war begins. And it's just like, what fucking stage capitalism is this? Like, or is yeah. this just the dystopian hell that we're living in? I, I, it's, it is uh, deeply troubling. Um, before I forget, however, let me finish my point regarding the three feedback loops, because we can touch upon that as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, kind of evolution. So we just tackled the economic growth point, which you can punch this into a computer, the, the dynamics of agent behavior in a capitalist economy will always erode their, their, uh, their resources into oblivion by default because of the very nature of the system. Then you have the second most tragic feedback loop, which is the inequality generation I mentioned earlier. That is the fact that mathematically, left to its own devices, with no intervention, the system will always allocate disproportionately and extremely so. And then you have the third one, which is a little bit more difficult to express. I, I, the last podcast we talked about was called the ice, iceberg model, which is a basic sociological model that is very common. You, you have events like, say, school shootings, you know, someone goes and shoots somebody in a mass shooting. Then you have a pattern, which is the, uh, the enormous number of school shootings, or excuse me, mass shootings that we have. We have well over 100 in the United States alone, uh, fairly indiscriminate mass shootings, you know, anger shootings. And then you have the structure, which means that you have an event, you have a pattern of events, and then you have a structure. Or structure it's coming at you. you look at it, I'll get back to it then. The pattern, right? And that is a fundamental you know, framework. And within that framework, there's something else that's underneath. They call it a mental model. And this is based on an assumption that the people that engage, you know, all of us that are thinking, wandering around this planet, we must be creating the structure, right, as the starting point. And this is, again, this goes back to a psychological view of reality. It's very false. Uh, it's one of the biggest problems we have in the, in the perception of people out there today. The fact that it's thought that we are the point of origin it's an egoism that we have. It's built into our free will, just like in our criminal justice system. No one asks what happened to these people, very rarely, unless someone has an insanity plea. No one asks, you know, what happened in poverty or whatnot to you know, someone to go pickpocket somebody else and they get thrown in jail. It's all based on a completely free will notion. You know, you're responsible. You know, it's the same conservative thinking that bleeds over into other ideologies. Like, oh, you can work, you can pull yourself up by your bootstraps. The system can't possibly be oppressive. You, it's always up to you and you and you. So that psychology is deeply built into this mental model concept. And this is, I, I won't list names if it goes through this kind of thinking, but it's, it's endless. Almost every single major political commentary person I've met in economics or listened to still believes that we have just made decisions. Okay, and, that, and that's half true, that's the problem. And what I'm getting at here is that the structure. The structure of our society, as alluded to before, the culture it creates, the incentives it has, the rewards, the punishments, is codifying the human brain, on average, creating certain patterns of behavior. So there's a nasty feedback loop between the structure and people's way of thinking, that mental model. And that is the third feedback loop. Everything that's happening in society right now is constantly trying to drive interest back into the established system. You made a unique point earlier about how all of this stuff that's come forward, um, I'll use the example of the rise of Trump. So we have a terrible demo public and horrible political establishment across the world, but the United States is the easiest example in terms of you know, the fundamental neuroses that we're talking about. Um, and so he rises. What has he actually done, really? He's set up system preservation. Because people are so horrified of this character. They're now going back to George Bush and Obama and thinking these guys are great. This is what we need, right? So there's, there's, that's one example of these multiple feedback groups that are keeping people in a position to preserve in the short term or to think that you know, this is just the way it is and anything else should be feared. And that is by far the most uh, treacherous area. But that's where the activists have.
So now I would say that you know if we're going to move away from this kind of system, we have to begin building a smaller version of a new system and scaling it out. It's a common sense notion. It's been thought about by a couple people out there, but it's never really been pursued. But that's a big focus of mine in the background right now, and we'll be paired with this like next four. Uh, Zeitgeist addendum to the Zeitgeist movement, which has had a unique organic rise, and stabilized, and it's through great communities across the world. Now it's time for an actual institutional development that gets people off the goddamn grid of market capitalism. And it can be done. And that's the beauty of what we what the, the core economic drive, the core benefit of me as an innovative species, the ability to create and to innovate is to be able to produce things where we do more and more and more with less and less and less. And that is the core economic interest. That's why things should be getting cheaper now. The profit center. Profit center, excuse me. If we harness that as activists, we start to build new systems that are going to naturally become more resource, excuse me, less resource intensive and, and quote, less costly. Granted, I say costly, that's within the bounds of the market you know, extinction. The less intensive, less labor intensive, less resource intensive. We are on the verge of being able to harness that to create a parallel organization of civilization. And that's the only way I see getting out of this. I don't think we're going to be able to rise up and you know, overthrow this or create enough political you know, fermentation to conquer this problem. I think those days are over unless you want just straight violence, uh, which, of course, is what we're fighting against anyway, because when those three feedback loops continue their process as the ecological decline feedback loop, continues as the inequality feedback loop continues, which is deeply caustic, not only on the domestic scale, but on the international scale. And then the mental model problem with the fact that people are consistently reinforced with the same sick value system and sick incentives. Those three things are going to, are, are basically one giant loop that is assuring our demise if we don't move fairly quickly with new system development, pulling people into a new, mo new mode of behavior. And I'll just conclude by saying that that new mode, of course, has to be minimalistic. And that is one of the most difficult cultural things. To all those people listening that, you know, are still locked in this world of material, remember this. And it's not necessarily a Buddhist notion. I think it's a pure psychological notion. The more you think you need, the more you are basically, um, the more you are insecure in a way that needs to be resolved through other means. The most insightful, I should say the most, uh, I can't get the right word, the most pronounced moment I think get done. the most uh fuck what am I oh, I'm gonna find the right <laughs> word here. I hate it when I have a word it just doesn't it doesn't decide to come out. When one word doesn't come to you out of the hours period of time. Uh, we'll use the word enlightenment. The most yeah, enlightened position is someone that can sit and not need fucking anything. Mm -hmm. If you can start to train yourself to think that way, and every time you see something, or every time you strive for something, or you feel that drive to want to attain, it doesn't necessarily have to be material, but the most balanced state you can be in is one, a Zen, if you will, it could be considered a Buddhist philosophy, is one where you don't actually need it. Because the sickness of having, like, multi-room mansions and jets, I mean, the liability of that, think about the kind of mental insecurity that you know, underscores that necessity to have an interest for more and more and more. And uh, it's unfortunate that that value system, of course, is promulgated by people in power, and that's another part of this feedback loop which I'll conclude with, is one of the reasons things are not changing is because this value system is ingrained. Everyone gets more money, they become more famous, they become more powerful, and these are the, these become the figure, figureheads of the values of society. And that's that's another treacherous uh, angle of this. It's, it's really dark. Oh my god, I mean, you just said so many incredible things. I mean, yeah, these dominant feedback loops are, affect everyone. I mean, even the most well-intentioned and passionate activists, many liberals, for example, who are, like, naturally repelled by war and poverty and want to do something about it, they are stunted um, yeah. due to the nature of the system by electoralism or local activism. And it, I mean, it reminds me of just the speech from Carl Sagan that you recently showed, or I'm sorry, played on your mm -hmm. podcast. I mean, this, I was shocked to learn that in 1985, yeah, Carl yeah. Sagan, uh, rest his soul, fucking brilliant man right there, really, really amazing guy. I mean, the fact that he had the foresight to be out there that long ago, a year after I was born, talking about you know, something that 50 years later we are really dealing with 
potential apocalyptic cataclysmic changes in the climate in the next 10 years, Peter, if we don't do anything about it, which I think that it's far too gone to do anything about now. And, I mean, bringing me to the point of, of also groupthink. I mean, wanting to belong to something, wanting to not deviate from what, everything that you know. You know, the status quo is a mentality of even if you are so well-intentioned and you realize that, you know, this is not the way that things should be, you still, it's so paralyzing and debilitating to think of being able to do anything to change something that is global. And so this now global awareness and global interconnectedness that we have this consciousness that I feel like has just expanded more and more, but at the same time, the debilitation of the overwhelming nature of the information that's coming at us, that it, it's all of these different dynamics coupled together that really do make it very difficult to navigate. Um, and unfortunately, because anti-communism is the bedrock of our society, I think people look at the centralization of power or anything related to the government as totalitarianism. And like they just think that freedom equates to free markets, right? You, we're all millionaires in the waiting. Like, we all just have to work hard enough and we can be the next Elon Musk. And don't get me started on how Elon Musk is like the dumbest motherfucker to ever, ever walk here. Somehow he's the richest person. What does that say about the nature of, of the economy, especially because he's somehow called a renegade? Sorry, but that, that those two things can't be true at the same time. You can't be a renegade and be the richest man on earth. Sorry. Exactly. Um, but, but this fear, this fear, of the other, of something else other than what we've always known, I think is very difficult, difficult for people to confront because it must mean, right, that you have no freedom or creativity to do anything. We'd all be clones living in Orwell's 1984. So I guess just address that kind of binary of freedom versus totalitarianism with something that is, you know, for me, it's like, look, we either have a planned economy or we don't organize according to our needs and in conjunction with the limitations of a finite planet. And it's, yeah, it's really fucking scary to think of what a global transformation of the economy would look like, but it's a better option than not having a human race to survive, because we literally do not have a choice any longer, and it ha and I used to think, oh, it must stem from like a massive shift in consciousness to understand the scale and urgency of this, but it's not just an issue of like morality and empathy and media literacy, like, I don't know what it is, Peter, because it's like, what came first, the chicken or the egg? Like, first you need the consciousness to embrace something so dramatic of a change, but at the same time, it seems like the machine is operating on its own, and that people have to be like what Mario Savio said, like, we literally have to put our bodies on the gears of this, this machine to save the future of humanity. Yeah, I, very good points, very difficult points, um, subject-wise, and I, I think you hit it well to take the egg concept and my response to that is you have to not only educate people to know what a proper, you know, sustainable public health respecting society would be, the parameters of which are very obvious. But you have to put people in a situation where they begin to experience how that feels in terms of their day-to-day -day life. And that that's fairly common sense. There have been people out there that have tried, as I mentioned earlier, tried to develop communities that you know, could start to do that. In most cases, they fail miserably. There's a couple smaller places in India and the like, but they they're so small that they just they're just anomalous communities. They don't they wouldn't serve the function. Their values would, but the, the actual technologies that they use wouldn't serve the function for mass you know, mass social survival. So that is by far the most difficult. And going back to what you said, you know, everyone wants to think. At least most people want to think it comes down to individual choice, and if we all just make different choices within the structure, that's by far the most enraging thing. By the way, I always keep hearing people talk about that want to preserve the system. And then, uh, let me start on, on the manifesting your own reality thing. It's like, yeah, let's just yeah, yeah. manifest our reality. That, that'll that'll turn out well. You know, I think you know, it's interesting you bring that up as an aside. I'm, I have some notes here based on what you said as well. I'll get back to is in the 60s, you know, you had this sort of uh, revolutionary moment in, in terms of, well, I don't know how to describe it. It wasn't a revolution in terms of society whatsoever, but there was a weird kind of fusion of things, you know, everything was breaking in a particular way, the psychedelic revolution, the uniformity of art started to emerge, you had experimentation, you had more sexual freedom, for better or for worse, you know, lots of sick institutions like Playboy that emerged and stuff like that, uh, with you know, all sorts of different manipulative elements, but within the confines of... 
of this evolution, there was some positivity to breaking molds, right? And what happened, though, is once the kind of 80s and 90s rolled around, all those idealists, all those hippies, as it were, all those changers, revolutionaries, you know, protesting the Vietnam War, they completely acquiesced. And then they started to create the philosophy of inward revolution. So now you have everyone going to meditation groups. And, yep. you know, and, and even in some cases, even though I think, you know, like ayahuasca sessions, stuff like that can be broadly widening, many people use that, unfortunately, still to preserve their own internal well-being, working to ignore their surroundings. So you have this self-help kind of thing that's emerged now. And that's still most prominent. I mean, look at the self-help. I mean, all these people are growing up in this society. They feel horrible. They don't know why they feel alienated or why they're depressed. They don't understand the dynamics because I think it's fundamentally unnatural and you know, a very profound level to raise people in this kind of world. And since they don't know what it is, they think something wrong with them, and then you have the therapy. You know, so it's all great for the uh, psychiatrists and the psychologists and the, uh, the self-help people to have a sick society like this. But that's where the evolution has morphed in terms of culture. So very rarely do you hear anyone talk about structural anything. It's right, it's just hyper, it folds into the hyper-individualism. Absolutely. And uh, while there is, of course, relevance to people breaking their molds of thought and seeing things differently, what you realize about the human being is we're deeply vulnerable, we're throughput. If something isn't reinforced that we're idealizing, then we're not necessarily going to pursue it. And you'll occasionally get a few heroes. I use that example of like Martin Luther King or Gandhi or some of these folks that have kind of risen above and you know, criticized culture to every degree and trying to be revolutionary. Uh, those, are, those are the few and far between. Statistically speaking, everyone is just trying to survive in their paycheck to paycheck world. They can't think about philosophy. It's like that old George Carlin quote, you know, some people think about what is and ask why. Some people think about what isn't and ask why not. Some people, some people have to go to work and don't have time for all that shit. <laughs> which, summarize, which summarizes effectively this paralysis, once again, that people are not given the freedom to breathe because they're so stressed by their fundamental existence. Now, uh, going back to your comment about um, the fear of anything other than capitalism basically being totalitarianism, I really like what you said in terms of a lack of creativity, that Ayn Rand sort of thing where there's no identity, because ironically, that's precisely what capitalism has done. Capitalism has created a self-preserving institution. It's like a, it's like a monster. I, I often attribute the system to an organism identity because it behaves in its own way because of the collective impression, because of the way people react to each other in these various feedback loops. It creates this, this sort of organism that has a life of its own. And it sort of preserves itself through all sorts of unique, uh, kind of, I'm being esoteric here, but it, that's the way I think the best way to visualize it. It's like a system that has a mind of its own that we are, are inside of in, in this complicated chemistry and we can't break away from. And when we do try to break away from, the system has uh, antibodies that come after us and tries to take us out in various different ways in order to preserve itself. And one of the ways it does that is by the false duality. You can't have any conversation with a traditional person and bring up anything like capitalism without them instantly bringing up you know, the failures of socialism, the Soviet Union, or, you know, or communism, or, 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 or this just tremendous failure of creativity. Like we, what? This is it? This is this is our polarized reality? There's no other option? You know, in the work that I've done, many others around me, what we're going to end up with in the future, if we can get past this hurdle, is not some central planning arrangement. It's going to be a decentralized, peer-to-peer kind of kind of network of civilization pockets. I talk about it in my book. It's what Gandhi often referred to, because he was intuitively against mass industrialization, because he could see the kind of power networks that would be created uh, that would be inhibiting and basically create more poverty and inequality, which is precisely what it has done in the long run. And so you end up with a kind of a, a floating parallel series of societies that are independent as much as possible, and when they can't be independent, they use their peer-to-peer -peer decentralized nature to engage forms of transactions, not monetary in these cases, absolutely, but are able to gain resources and services and acquisitions through a concentrated network that is not centralized, but decentralized, but networked. And that's something that people in the networking communities out there, if anyone does program, and they're very much aware of that in the open source community. Uh, but that's not something that most political people ever talk about, you know what I mean? That's mm -hmm. it's always just central planning, and like, oh, it's just going to be a bunch of bureaucrats sitting at the table deciding what everyone gets. Uh, that's 
Anyway, I won't go down that road of all the other permutations, but this failure of creativity is not a stifling form that's going to be the death of us. I mean, what, that's all you can think of, people? <laughs> well, right, that, that's, they want to confine us into that line of thinking because they don't want us to envision a utopian society, uh, a beautifully democratized and symbiotic ecosystem that can exist, where people can collaboratively work right. together and grow society. Um, Peter, let's open it up to some callers here to close this out. Uh, this Sounds has been good. an incredible conversation.
what you want. It's done. Stop.
You need something, huh? One of your rides? Let me know. on the way. I'll get back to it then. What are you after? What are we doing today? Now what do you need? Making decisions is stressful.
Life is hard when you can have anything. Through to your garage. You, uh, need me to bring you a ride? I'll bring it by. All right, I'll get back to work.
Chef. Action. Conquest. The Diamond Casino and Resort has redefined luxury in a town that redefines itself every year until it's an erotic mess. Taylor, stop it. So weird. What you need, boss? Some wheels? I can bring them around. I'll get there as soon as I can. Okay, I got stuff to do.
Hey, what's going on? No problem. I'll get him off your back. Calling for some wheels? I'm Johnny on the spot. I'll hook you up. I'll get back to it then.
o'clock. What you want? Some wheels? I'll bring it by. Business isn't exactly booming, you know. Oh, please. You're through to your garage. You, uh, need me to bring you a ride? I'll bring it to you. All right, I'll get back to work.
something, huh? One of your rides? Let me know. Coming at you. Okay, I got stuff to do.
Hi. What you need, boss? Some wheels? I can bring them around. I'll get back to it then.
What are we doing today? Anything I can do? Anything at all? Whatever you desire. Technology and budget permitting. Life is hard when you can have anything. Think long and hard. How many cars you got in this garage again? No rush at all. Making decisions is stressful. Your cosmetics are on point. Girl is looking good. There you go.
What were you looking for? What are you after? Do you need a drink? Bubbles or something? Don't she look pretty? Here for the magic touch.
You're through to your garage. You, uh, need me to bring you a ride? Boss? You gonna hit me with it? I'll bring it to you. Okay, I got stuff to do.
something, huh? One of your rides? Let me know. You there? Sometime today, please! It's coming at you. I'll get back to it then. This is a de facto asshole right here. 